village council meeting come to order. Uh, roll call, please. Deputy Clerk, Tammy. Schulte. Here. John Byrne. Here. Dan Field. Here. Walter. Here. Hitchcock. Here. We're all here. We got a quorum. Okay, can everybody stand up? Please flag, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have to amend our agenda to add Northern Pump. So I recommend to the council that we just under new business. This is at the very top approval agenda. We just got to add it so we can approve Northern Pump at the end of our program. So I just want everybody to recommend. I need something to say. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say aye. Okay. So that's good. Really. Any public comment other than what we are got on our agenda today? Okay. Thank you. I'm supposed to open that and close that, but one person here. Okay. Our consent agenda. Minutes for our council meeting February 28, 2023. Accounts payable, investment report, a revenue and expenditure report, and balance sheets and the consent agenda. Everybody have a chance to look at that, go through that, or do you want to go through it now? Not recommend to the council that we approve it as the time. Second. Okay, any discussion? If not, roll call, please. Deputy Clerk Tammy. Schulte? Yes. John Horn? Yes. Sam Field? Yes. Walter? Yes. Hitchcock? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now we're at the police report. I see our deputy Chris is here. Coming. How are you? Good. How are you guys? Great. Uh, so it was a pretty slow, slow month in February. Uh, a couple of things happened. Uh, see, on the second, I responded to uh, Main Street, 500 block of Main Street, for a custody complaint, uh, which turned into a child abuse complaint. Uh, basically. Uh, mother and father arguing over who has custody of their almost adult child. Um, mother took them, uh, had them removed from Pablo High School to attend Pablo High School by court order. Uh, there was a uh, the child. <clears throat> child stated that their uh, their maid that. He thought the mom assaulted him at the car when she was removing him from the school as well as at her house. Uh, between myself and Pablo PD, we figured it out, and uh, um, the child and the father wanted to press child abuse charges, which had just got those back uh, the other day, and they denied charges for child abuse, citing it was a custody dispute, and it was probably charged based on that. Um, on two seven, a lot of people know about this. February seventh, uh, multiple uh, fake um, active shooter calls were uh, initiated around the state of Michigan, uh, most notably here in Okemos. Um, we literally had everyone in the county, probably the Tri County area, clearing Okemos High School. It turned out to be a fault. Uh, call. However, if we're going to have training, this is probably the best training we could ever have. So we took it as a great training moment. Um, I've been working hand in hand with uh, Superintendent Andy Smith at the schools to uh, just make sure that we're on board what we know we want to do and make sure their policies are up to date. And just really. 
making sure we have a good plan in place, and, and they're updating their policies and procedures. So, um, if anything, we took a lot of good training out of this. And then a couple of days later, uh, we had an older student on the high, on the bus um, assault a younger student for making a noise. Uh, no charges were pressed, but the older student one is uh, uh, suspended and uh, was recommended this is the mental health evaluation. So going back to the active violence uh, call, uh, like you said, we've been really working hard with the uh, with the superintendent and the schools to make sure the school is as safe as possible. They're adding just an enormous amount of cameras, and um, and and I guess for folks at the village, that when they ask for technology, uh, technology money, that's where that's going. And I can tell you that they're using the money very well um, to update their cameras, making sure they're all in the right places, um, making sure the school is, is as safe as possible. It's got to be one of the safest schools. Not because of the cameras, but just just a lot of what they do. But um, as far as cameras go, they, they got them everywhere. They got them everywhere. So um, that's about all I got. There hasn't been a lot going on at the school, and the town's been pretty quiet. Other than that, so <coughs> we got anybody got any questions? No. How's it working? Only being forty hours. Um. You get five days at 40 hours or no I do four tens okay um just to uh, helps me out a little bit and I think it just gives you guys a little bit more coverage I know that whole other day but I think having a 10 hour day here is better than an eight hour day um, mostly because I can be there before and after uh, when school lets out and gets in I can I can patrol the corner and, and help cross and guard stuff so um, I like that uh, we've had a couple people call in and, and say that they're, they've noticed a lack of uh, 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 patrols out, out and about which is reasonable uh, they uh, I'm talking with my uh, co-workers to get out here a little bit more but um, I think it's fine I haven't felt overwhelmed or anything by anything going on and being here during the day is an opportunity to meet with the businesses and and uh, make sure they know who I am and, and what we have available and how we're supporting them so they've been very uh, receptive to that so I appreciate it yeah thank you okay you need anything from us again I know Matt's probably miss the, the bicycling days. I know he's probably. Yeah, that'll be coming out here soon. <laughs> so. Okay. But we appreciate what you do. If you need anything else, let us know. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. And then he did, he, he's got a deal where he, he found and uh, he texted to me so we can fill that for more uh, help with a grant on um, helping with policing in the town. So I'm going to give that to one of the girls to work on and fill it out. Either you or Deborah and Kiwana, he texted to me and we'll look at it together as three and fill out the paperwork and see if we can get some of that grant money. Okay? So what would that go towards? Would it go towards our current police contract or would that go towards additional something or other? I seen it here and it's on tip of my tongue. You, when you looked into it, I looked into it. Right? <coughs> I, I looked at it a little bit. It was. Uh, as a federal grant, I didn't, I didn't beat the whole thing, but it was geared towards uh, community safety is really what it was, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to get some money uh, for your guys' village, and, and uh, you know, the grants really aren't usually too hard to fill out, so, sure. but anything, it's just safety of the village, really. Yeah, so it's not nothing specific. very specific. specific no, I don't think so. Or, okay. yeah. yeah, it's cool. just... What can we? What can we do to secure the village a little bit? Right. I should have figured it out. Oh, here we go. Mouse look. Yeah. The, Did you find it? Yep. Yeah. It, first, it said it rerouted, but safe, <coughs> safeguarding tomorrow through ongoing risk mitigation and revolving loan fund program. So it just basically would help the town. This looks something we should fill out. State of Michigan. 
grant. Awesome. So we'll get on that. I'll get it set over and we'll fill it up. Let's come to people. Okay. Thank you. DPW report. You just want to fill us in on what we're doing, Ryan? I can. Uh, mistakes. You know, they're starting to pick up now. The weather's turning nice. Uh, people are going to be outside working. Yep. Um, I can't stress that enough to anybody and everybody. If you're going to do any sort of dirt work outside, whether you're putting in a garden, uh, something simple as a flower bed, call on a mistake. They're free to do, and it will save you a lot of money in the long run. Um, I am certified in the Mystic system as a locator and as an operator, um, so I see it on both sides of things. Call them in. It takes five minutes to do. doesn't make anything less. saves a big headache if you cut into a gas line or a fiber optic line, especially fiber. Just this winter, uh, a lot of fiber went underground. So if you find that without a Mystic, you're talking a lot of money. Um, water samples are still coming back good. Uh, I know we added a proposal from Northern Well um, to add in some controls to our well houses. We had a VFD installed at Well House 1 and 2 that controls our wells turning on and off uh, softer. Instead of a hard on and a hard off, they kind of ramp up slowly and turn off slowly. Helps prevent water hammer on the system. Should cut down on water main breaks. Um, so this proposal will help with that in turning on our chemical feed pumps. That way we know we are injecting the proper amount of uh, chlorine in the water. So that's why we added that. Um, that went well at that VFD. It was a big deal to our system. Um, water shutoffs last time everybody paid. So we ended up not having to shut anybody off, so that's a good thing. Take the door hangers and get the work out there. Helps with customer service issues. People are paying their bills. Um, brush pickup. I know we got the schedule out there now. Uh, gonna start going through our brush shipper real quick. Make sure that's up and running. Getting our trucks handled. <laughs> uh, kind of goes with vehicle maintenance. We have uh, two trucks down right now. Uh, parts came in. Get the one dump truck fixed. Um, had to have our bucket truck towed because nobody knows what's wrong with it. So. Just kind of with the old equipment, um, hot patching, cold patching, filling in potholes. That's kind of been been hearing some uh, people talk about that out in the out in the community. Weather's getting nice now. We shouldn't have to plow anymore. Uh, we do have a couple of ton of cold patch in stock now, so we're going to be out doing that on these nice days. Um, other than that, I think they're all right. Uh, we did start on our saw grant that will help GPS all of our infrastructure, whether it's water valves, fire hydrants, any village owned utility or infrastructure out there. We'll be able to uh, GPS them within the inch. So we'll have a map of that, help us locate everything, kind of help with our asset management. Um, so that has started. Um, we're getting the ball rolling with uh, Spicer, I do believe is who's handling that. Um, other than that, that's about all I have. Any questions, concerns? Everybody knows where to find us. Thank you. I think you brought up a really good point with the gardens and stuff because, you know, how many of us have had gardens and never thought to call? I don't have a garden because I can't even grow a plant. I kill a rubber tree. <laughs> that's easy. I really did. Um, but I mean, that is a really good point, and maybe we could put that in the newsletter. Yeah. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that have had gardens for a while, but with the cost of groceries and everything else going up, there's probably a lot of people thinking about getting gardens, and they're probably not going to think about that. Um, the Mystic system is 811. I do believe on their website I can check. Uh, I do believe they have a logo that you're allowed to use for any publications because it's such a big deal because people don't think of it like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Fences, That's, you know, that season's here. 18 inches um, down, you hit that natural gas line. You hit a gas line, it's going to Very cost. high pressure. You know, you were with us that night when we had to dig the one up, and, you know, luckily we were using our hydro excavator where we found it softly, you know, instead of tearing through with the back. Um, so, yeah, just the, the mistake is a huge thing to me. I, uh, because I have to fix it. If it's ours and it gets hit, I have to fix it. So. The back truck is like, 
yeah. one of the most that is one of the really important things to do when it comes to getting into the ground because it's the safest way to get in the ground. Yeah, it's a, considered a soft excavation, so you still have to put a mist dig in legally, but using a vacuum, a vacuum system, you're a lot safer. Odds are you're not going to damage anything if you do it to your hole. Yeah, you think it's a root? It's not. Yeah. <laughs> Roots are generally not bright yellow. There are some out there that are, but generally not. You should do a Facebook broadcast on that, too. Yeah. But, okay. you know, with, with spring coming, first day of spring is next week, I do believe. So it's, uh, it's a big deal. I know the Mystic system, they try to advertise as much as possible. But, you know, it's free. And that's... If something's free, somebody's more likely to, to utilize it. It doesn't sure. cost you anything to do it. So um, we're, we pay the association fees every yep. year. Yep, we're a member. Yep. So it's yeah. a, it protects us. Yes, it does. It's easier to do it without breaking it. Mm -hmm. it's, and just like little critters, you know, possums, you know, things like that. Is there something we could put maybe in the newsletter? about who people can call, maybe, because we're going to start getting phone calls. Trust me, I have lots of possums that run around my neighborhood. and Marmots? Yeah. Well, oh, God, yeah. I know rodent control, you know. I feel like one in there, that's why I brought it up. We kind of do have to. house right down here on Chestnut yep. between, what is it, Well, It's right behind me. Yeah, yeah it's right on Chestnut. It's like um, Cat in front of my house. She's got babies under mm -hmm. there every spring, call under the front department. porch. Yeah, there's there's yeah. resources out there between pest control the companies department. and county right. animal control. Well, yeah. sometimes they'll, honestly, if you call, they'll say, you know, it's not ours. It's you know. not our problem. Yeah, and that's why I said maybe if we could put something in about who you call for certain things, it cuts down on the number of phone calls here mm -hmm. so that people do know the right number <clears throat> to call. Maybe we can get somebody to do a live trap. And well, the health department will, I mean, because the sidewalk, there's a sidewalk, correct? Mm -hmm. So they are, they are supposed to come out with apartments <laughs> being on close to the sidewalk. We, we had it over here. That's how we got this house taken down. So. Yeah, they're... They'll at least come out and take a look. Nobody's called the health department yet to tell no, us, but you give me the address on that, and we'll call the health department and tell them what we got going on. If there's marmots with an address, yeah, yeah, it's right under, yeah, right under the front porch. I mean, we own the house five years, so I guess I called like five years ago, and then I called four years ago, okay. and nobody bothered to Let's try it again. respond to anything. So I have my morning coffee on my porch, and, and I watch them go in and out know. under the porch. Yeah, let me have that. We can call the health department. I'm just thinking of all with yep. you know spring coming <clears throat> things that are gonna crop up phone calls. We're gonna get as much help as you know. Yep. We can get the community. That's how you were. Okay. Mr. Jim Wright, the ordinance officer, and I we did it that way. The health department. I had raccoons in there. Okay. Um, quick trip report. We have gotten all signed up with the MSHDA, um, a new program to assist homeowners in bill paying. We are now our, our participants. We've had many people that are willing to help and organize for the community picnic. Building permits and fees have been updated in the system with a big part of it um, being Jim's help. We received a letter from a third grader and wanted village history for a school project so the library and Jessica got her a few things for that. We had to send the IRS 941s again because the IRS could not find the ones we already sent. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> the DDA received the MUSTA check that we have been waiting on. Nice. We heard back from the American Legion Publishing. They are going to be processing our supplements for our ordinances. And we've had a lot of su success collecting overdue payments and large outstanding bills. I have been enforcing the utility protocol. Payment plans, you're only allowed two, and you cannot have another one if you have not met the terms on the other two. Late fees applied, red tags and shutoffs going out when they are supposed to. We've had quite a few come up and catch, come in and catch up on their payments. <clears throat> and I so far have had six of those payment plans 
that have not met the terms since October, they came in and signed a payment plan and never made a payment since. So they're kicked off. <laughs> Well, with the building permits and fees um, being addressed, is that have that has that been updated on our on our website, or is it just the internal system for right now? I think it's just internal. Okay. Um, is that something that the council needs to approve? Where do you see that? Uh, the third item, the building permits <coughs> and fees. It's been updated in our system. Well, Jim's working on it. He's got his hand up, Mr. Jim Wright. Oh, sorry, Jim. <laughs> Uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, change any of these. What's happened over the years, somehow these got manipulated in the VSNE system, so they weren't, weren't correct. These were added that were never approved. So we went back to the original council approvals for fees and updated and changed the fees, changed the fees in the system so they reflect what was approved by the council. And the, uh, I think we had three meetings over the past 12 years mm -hmm. addressing building permit fees. So we, we, Got everything back to where it was supposed to be originally. Gotcha. And um, I worked with Tammy and Jessica with the forms. They have the forms so they can update the forms down with the right, right fees. There's only some minor adjustments that had to be made with them. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the forms, and Tammy can testify this, that the forms weren't matching what the fee schedule was inside the, the system. Mm -hmm. Now it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to see it, but I'd be curious to see what the before and after was. I don't know if that's really feasible. I don't know. Once I once I updated it, the before is gone. You're right. Yeah. Figure. So all right. Well, I'd like to see that get online. So if, Josh, if anything needs updated on the website, make sure it gets to Josh to, to do that. I'm sure most of the stuff is probably from the last approval. Mm -hmm. So, if the, but yeah, it'd be good to double check everything, right. make sure it's correct. What would you want to add, Jim? So, no, nothing. So, like when they keep mentioning they want to get it up on a system, what you have correct is online with what you work with on a daily basis. Right? Uh, we don't have the BSNA online system. Okay. So, it'd be nice if I would. Uh, when the former clerk was here, we were talking about getting that system set up, but we never went to that system yet. It's an I would recommend that we do do it, but we're not we're not there yet. So all, our system is all manual. If someone wants to apply for a permit, they have to physically bring it bring in or mail in a permit. So there is no real BSA online system with fees there. Uh, the fees that are available online are those that are on the actual permit applications. And the majority of those were correct. There's only some minor tweaks that had to be made in them and a couple of fees that had to be corrected. Just I think it was just two fees. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Jim Wright, ordinance officer? Nope. Thank you, Tammy, for quick charter for reading the report. Is there anything else you need from our council people? Is everything been going good? Yep, going real good. Okay. I, I do have a question for Tammy. Um, where are we at on opening the customer portal for uh, water storage? It's still too soon. Is There's it? still issues with okay. that. Mm -hmm. I Just because I was in a home the other day and they asked about it. I'm going to have to get to with water scope on some of those. And what that means is, if everybody get them up, is somebody's savvy on getting online, they could actually check their water as they're using it, so it's not something that's described in 30 days. I know we use it a few times. Mel had it, and a couple people, but not everybody's accessible to get it at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a phone app as well, and you can track all of your usage and leak detections and alerts for vacations. And Pretty have, you, have you done it yet? Yes, I have it set up on my phone. So if somebody's smart enough to set it up, you can get it set up? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I don't know what this customer portal is. I don't know if that's separate, but I know, um, I forget who it was, the people from the water meter company uh, sent me, yes, thank you, Metron, sent me how to sign up and where to get the serial number uh, off of my meter and I set it up that way. I'll, 
It's is that separate from the customer center. portal? There's also codes in everybody's account too that they yeah. will have to call us to get to be able to get into their own right. account. I got a text from our clerk treasurer, Jessica Pooch, which is able to watch us from her meetings up in Mount Pleasant. <laughs> Minister Josh Rocky, our DDA, he does have the updated permits that was sent to him and she can resend them to you. That's not how they can get to you. Excellent. Yeah, yeah they, they, all the ones that were sent should be up on, on the site then. Okay, good deal. All right, sounds good. Now, it, it is the Warrenville Downtown Develop Authority Report. I like the muster program. That's kind of nice. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the parking lot's coming along. Um, they just did the bid for the excavation. So the excavation, um, they went and had to go with the lowest bidder because that's per muster's claim process. So um, they're going to get us a schedule of that. And I reached out to them to have them work with Alan and the drain commission with mainly with our purpose of doing that parking lot there and having to do the um, catch basin, just making sure that they're not going to fill a bunch of holes that obviously we don't really need built back up with dirt if they're just going to get excavated again. So, um, but yeah, other than that, we're still working on the Ford building. Uh, we have to go to a phase two, so the next DA meeting will be discussing that. If we're going to pay for that or not. You're any more on the, the old Ford building? That's what, That's what you were talking about? Yeah. On yeah, the, the phase one came back and it, it came back good, but it came back bad at the same time because it came back that there's no evidence of tanks, but there's also no evidence of the tanks being removed because there used to be on the corner of um, Summit and Grand River, there was actually um historical pictures of pumps on that corner so they don't show eagle doesn't show the tanks were ever removed but they also don't show so that's why they want to go phase two because they want to be able to do borings and the um ground penetrating radar to see if they can see if there's tanks beneath that asphalt that's on that corner what, what fee would that be when that goes to phase two <sighs> it's between ten and fourteen thousand dollars so I'm going to see if we can get a brownfield grant for that, but we kind of exhausted that, and I don't know if they've replenished that yet. So we got Jim here, might help us out here. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Um, Josh, I have some years ago, I did some research on it, and I have some stuff from when I was DQ paperwork from them when they, they did that verification of those tanks being taken out. Oh, really? So okay. I have some paperwork from that. I'll have to do some research, but it goes back things like eight years ago when I did that because we had someone interested at the time and was, okay. but I do have something yeah if you have something that would be helpful because I mean they reached I'm sure they reached out to DQ and I'm sure DQ basically it was, the story was it wasn't done completely right the way it was supposed to be removed but yeah. it was removed okay and there was some talk about even some other tanks that some Fuel oil tanks, a lot of fuel oil tanks that could have been there, but they never found those. Yeah. So I have that paper. I have to take, I have to go did do some digging, bro. Yeah. Some digging and find that. Yeah, no, that would be awesome because that would actually help us, you know, hopefully be able to not really yeah, have to pursue the phase two on it. Um, because, I mean, it might not be necessary if we're not going to rip up that anyway. And there's enough monitoring wells that are actually right in that corner that if there was a contamination, um, I know Ackerman. The um, K and J, they have a uh, well right there on that corner. So I mean, if they detected anything, they would have saw it by now. So but yeah. Save fifteen grand on Yeah, right <laughs> I would appreciate that. <laughs> that would be very nice. Thank you. Nice, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Building zoning report. Jim Rank, ordinance officer, or Chris Corey. Well. I mean, we're not going to talk about the written site till the agenda, the new business agenda, and we're going to talk about more, uh, well, anything else <laughs> for Well, I, I can give you an update from the building standpoint, just generally in the village. You can see that we got the old uh, Michigan Brewery tore down, yes. the S52 site. Uh, the, the owner uh, has turned control over to his son, who seems more amicable to want to make some changes on that site. 
Uh, he's done some uh, remodeling inside the actual gas station there from when there were some previous small fires and things like that. And he's got some grand plans for um, that area where the, uh, the brewery was at. I directed him to Chris Curry to start talking to him because it's actually two separate parcels there that he owns. Technically, he can't park trucks in the area where the uh, Michigan Brewery was at, although right now you they go by there and you see some trucks. Um, but those buildings are taken down, cleaned up, all that stuff is gone, footings are gone, and everything, so that, that was a, a nice accomplishment. We got it taken care of. Uh, you can see the work going on at the, Sinc the old Sinclair Grill. Uh, the owners uh, moved forward, getting his permits, and fixing that fire damage and cleaning it up. He wants to uh, uh, fix up the deck up front, put a covered porch over that deck, also covered area over that deck so they can have some seating out there. He's looking to try to get that cleaned up at least. Um, we have the new home going in on Cherry Street. Uh, we just got to finish with rough inspections on there. That's a nice little new home that's going in there. That probably be done in the next couple months. Uh, Anaker over at uh, QPS, the marijuana facility, he got his, uh, all his certificate of occupancies there. Uh, he's up and running. Um, He's going to open the place up to us probably this probably the second or third week in April for a tour. Yes. Um, I think uh, I know that a lot of our associates in McKenna are looking forward to going through them. I encourage anyone else here like to go through there and see a real high tech, top class operation. I suggest you come through there because that's one of the I've done a lot of marijuana facilities in my time since that's uh, or since that law has gone through, and this is one of the best facilities top notch facilities you'll ever see the automation in it the way he has that working i recommend if you get an opportunity to go along and find out the tape i'll let everybody know <clears throat> and i think you'll be nicely impressed with that uh, uh, facility there um, we got the uh thank you for the help in getting the uh the bus moved over at the fire hall uh, that got moved so that, that, that got cleaned up nice there. Uh, we had a home, uh, a rental property that was over on Clark Street that was, uh, the tenant had reported there was a lot of mold inside that. I, I talked about this a couple months ago uh, with the uh, furnace not operating properly and a, a hot water heater venting gas into the home. Uh, I condemned the home, the tenant moved out. The homeowner was going through marital problems, they took care of that. The wife took care of the house, cleaned it all up, got the furnace all cleaned up, molds all gone out of the house, new furnace, new water heater. Uh, house looks nice and now it's put up in the market. So that is one of the benefits we have from having these rental inspections done that we're finding, you know, homes that are not even safe to live in, that people are forced to live in, unfortunately. But through this, we're able to get into them, get the landlords to get them cleaned up. And, uh, safe for the tenants. So that, that was one nice home that got taken care of and is now on the market for sale. Um, ordinance wise, uh, we seem to be doing pretty good. I was informed this evening about a, a junk car, so we'll take care of that uh, next week. Uh, we've got a lot of couches and stuff removed around. So people seem to be taking the snow pretty well. Uh, generally, I think the village is looking pretty good right now. So. Have any other questions for me? Happy to answer from the building standpoint. Do we have anything going on in the, the dentist, the old dentist office? The where? The dentist office there by the lake. Uh, no, he's uh, he's called a couple times. I know that I gave Chris Corey his phone number. Chris has reached out to him and try to help him find a, a tenant for the place. Um, I know we're going to talk about uh, the 4696 Grand River um, coming up in a little bit. I will mention that. We've had calls from the U-Haul uh, guy that wants to move back in there with another with a different type of business, but we'll talk about that when we get to that in another agenda. And we have been, as Jim said, been contacted by some people who are potentially interested in being tenants over at the dentist's office site. Uh, you know, that building is good for some things and not great for others. Um, and some of the tenants that have called, or some of the potential tenants that have called that we've directed in that direction, it may not be the best fit. Uh, but we are trying to direct people to that site because we want to see that uh, being brought, brought back to life. Are there other properties that would be a better fit that we've been able to steer them towards, or is it just not a not feasible? Well, in some cases, 
we have some empty lots that would be good fits, but that's a big investment for some of these businesses that aren't really in the position to build themselves a brand new building, right, for obvious reasons. So, um, you know, so there's some places where it's like, some potential businesses where it's, well, I need this exact type of building. Well, if we don't have it, we don't have it, right? right? Um, so that's that's been an issue for some. Okay. Uh, 4,400 uh, Grand River, the Alpha Omega project, uh, they've been working with uh, Mr. Boyer as far as getting their site plan approvals done. I saw a letter come through, I think it was earlier this week, where uh, Alan recommended uh, approval for phases one and two, but not phase three. Uh, I still haven't gotten building plans for it. It's been going on almost a year now for building plans, and I think even the owner now is frustrated. And the last email I got from him, he was pretty frustrated with his architect. There's no reason why. Just take a lot that long to get a simple set of plans for a small project. Um, I think him and his architect are, are butting heads right now, so it's slowing, uh, slowing that end of it down. Uh, but uh, we did stop the burning that was going on out, out there. Uh, they had that, you know, they had those pink burning going out there. We stopped that. We got we get the chippers there. Uh, if I'm correct, that area on is supposed to be for a, a retention pond. Uh, the county had some concerns regarding the closeness of the retention pond to the septic field. Uh, that information that was passed on to Alan, we'll see how that, that works as far as that goes. But, um, I think they kind of got the cart before the horse a little bit as far as working in other phases before they get any plans for what they're occupied for right now. But we're working with them. Uh, I've stopped the the threats to him about trying to evict him because he is trying to work with us uh, there. So we'll see how it goes forward. And similar to Alan's approval, the, there is that site now is a zoning approval for phase one and phase two, but not for phase three. Phase three being another building on the, on the lot to the west. There wasn't enough detail to approve that from zoning or engineering uh, standpoint. And, and as Jim said, he doesn't have enough, doesn't have the plans for the interior build out at all, which is where the whole thing is right now. Gotcha. On Mason Court, when you go down to the industrial park, you turn left that, that nice long building there was bought. I think the gentleman's from Florida, I'm trying to find his name, I can't remember. Uh, are they getting anywhere? Are they doing anything, do you know, on that building before you get the, the old Chartier building on the left? When you turn on to Mason Court? It was the old, like the, the old sweatshirt place. Where they... No, I haven't heard anything on that. I know next to it was, I think next to that, you got the Chartier place, you got the marijuana grow place, then you have another marijuana place. Is that one open and, and running? Yeah, that one's oh, open and running. Both of them right side by side there from Chartier? Yeah, but he's not growing in there yet. He's just doing uh, processing. I he think. Process, just processing. I was in there changing the water meter and he kind of gave me a tour of it. Younger gentleman, right? Yeah. From yeah. Florida. Yeah. Okay, so he's... Yeah, he's, he's, he's doing the project. He's got plans to do grow eventually. He's got space back there, but... Right now, he hasn't come forward to do that yet. Okay. So that's fine. Right. I believe he is approved zoning wise for grow, but he hasn't done that's an true. interior build out plan. Not just to get on construction, he hasn't given plans. No, no, he doesn't plan on doing it right away. So he's only using part of the building right now. Right, exactly. And you know that across the street from there, um, the old, the newer old Michigan brewery, you know, we have yeah. parts, we have a, a I'm going right. to their house in there now. Yeah, right. right. They came out of the there. Came I stepped there. in and talked to the owner there a little bit. And he's happy, he's moving along well there. So that's good. There used to be a nice operation. Yes. He used to have a, uh, if you remember, there was a, 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 a gun ammunition loader that was in there for a while, but he's not there anymore. He's moved out of there. All right. That's good. Any more questions for the. Those are report, Jim Ordnance, Officer Jim Wright. Okay. Lisa, how are we doing? Um, so we had a meeting last Thursday, and um, the board was asked about the um, revenue sharing agreement. Um, I did let them know that it has gone to our PDA lawyer. And so I asked Josh, just reached out to him and asked him, you know, does he have any more information? Um, I guess the last meeting that they had, um, 
formally. Yeah. Formally, he yeah. wasn't he wasn't at the meeting. So hopefully he'll be at the next meeting, and then we'll have some more information on that. Uh, that's that for the revenue share, and then um, we the the staff at NISA actually got a letter from Alyssa Slotkin um, thanking them for their help at the MSU shooting. So that was kind of really nice that, you know, somebody recognized that okay. our fleet was in there. Okay. Lisa was up there helping take care of that. was nice. Other than the process that was happening. But, yeah. Right. Right. <coughs> so that's it. And then they got the new ambulances? Yeah. Or two they got two new ambulances in that building over there, <coughs> and then we have the two backup ambulances in Station 62. And we're 62 in Weberville, and it's 63 here. Yeah. 61. 61. 61 and 62 here. 61 is interesting. Yes. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for doing that. <coughs> Scott Gould, our attorney. Attorney reports. So, uh, update as to White Rose. Uh, I believe I mentioned at the last meeting that uh, they had appealed to circuit court on the district court ruling. Um, as, as of today, uh, defendant's briefs have been filed, our briefs have been filed, now it's just a matter of waiting for the court to uh, render an opinion. It's possible the court could request us to go in there and make oral arguments as to be determined. I have had similar cases where the judge will just on their own initiative, uh, given the facts and maybe from whatever's read in the brief, dismiss the matter without oral argument. So, um, I'll keep you posted as soon as I hear something on that matter. It is currently pending with Wanda Stokes. She's a circuit court judge in Ingham County that's now reviewing this matter. Um, district court, last time, we met, it might have been the same week, I'm trying to remember, like two weeks ago, we still had a hearing in regard to uh, attorney fees um, being the obligation of White Rose was protracted litigation. Um, the judge didn't rule in our, did not rule in our favor. However, he didn't rule against us either. He pretty much said that uh, he's not granting the motion as of that day. However, if we wanted to bring it back again, he would consider it. Um, so I guess it's still open. I get the impression that he's trying to put a little pressure on the parties to negotiate this thing away so he doesn't have to uh, render an opinion on it. Um, and either way, I guess it's at, a, it's at a point in which we've got to decide whether or not we want to keep pursuing them. Um, I will say that uh, to the circuit court brief, uh, I raised the issue of attorney fees again, so Wanda Stokes, Judge Wanda Stokes will see that and should possibly render an opinion on that. Um, let's see. Update as to Jamie Horde. It looks like her trial date has now been pushed back. Uh, Pre-trial uh, hearing or conference, I should say, pre-trial conference is now scheduled for March 29th. Uh, again, I get the impression that what's happening here is um, the defense attorneys try pushing this out as long as possible, probably in hopes of trying to secure some money to try and. Throw at mitigating, you know, throw at the court to try to mitigate the potential sentence. So um, I've seen that in investment cases in the past. It's usually what's going on. Uh, otherwise, the, the register of action with the court doesn't look to be anything out of place outside of that. Uh, spoke with Diane Wynn. She's with the insurance company that uh, is involved with the Jamie Horton matter. Uh, sounds like she's still putting things together. Oh, she said she keeps posted. So as soon as I get word on that matter, I'll relay it to you guys. But other than that, that's kind of an attorney report in a nutshell for right now, unless I want to ask specific questions. Okay. Anybody got anything for Mr. Scott Wolf? Okay. Mr. Scott. Alan Boyer, Engine Reports. Nice to see you, Alan Boyer. Good evening. <laughs> um, as you heard from uh, both Chris and Jim and from Josh. We're working with uh, the EDA on the Summit Street parking lot and uh, 
I'm glad to hear that Trey Terry has now got that out of bed. We've been talking back and forth with him, and it seems it's taking a while, but uh, that's good. I can give him a call again and uh, make sure we've got that information shared. Um, also, uh, as Jim noted, we're working with them on the site plan approval for Alpha and Omega out there, and at this point, as Chris noted, you know, we recommended that the village approve the site plan for phases one and two. Uh, we also had some communication with ISO. ISO is an uh, insurance company that does the village's fire rating, and uh, Shane had recommended that they contact me to get a latest copy of the uh, water reliability study, and so we provided that to them. So they are uh, apparently assessing that for updating the village's fire rating. Uh, as you know, you've got two construction projects that are coming up in the village this summer. Uh, one is Main Street. Most of that work is to be done between Memorial Day and Labor Day. That's the two blocks of Main Street between Grand River and Beach. And following up shortly after that is the water main replacement on Apple Lane, which is Beach Street extended east and then north. So that will be uh, that will be done by a different contractor, and obviously it will follow up um, from the Main Street construction. And we've also, I guess, finally provided some cost information to Jessica and to Plant Moran partly for the budgeting process that the village is going through related to the costs um, that the village would have for the water, the street, uh, and likely the DDA, and how that splits up for the budgeting. And Jessica had also contacted us about providing some of that information to her. And then, then I got a subsequent contact from Greg, Greg Todd, the county controller, asking for similar information because uh, I don't know if there's a, a movement afoot in the village to see if the county doesn't have some additional COVID money that would help offset some of those costs. So Greg Todd contacted me on behalf of the village to see if I could provide him with that information. So I don't know who's do, who's working with the county controller's office, but someone is. So that's where Greg is. Greg is the county controller, yes. So We've shared that information with them so that, you know, he asked and we gave it to them. So it's public information. I wonder if that, that might be our county commissioner. Okay. Or that You're right. right. Yes. Yes. Been right. trying to spearhead that to yeah. see if they can come up with some more money for yeah. for the project. Yeah. You're right. You are correct. That is, that is, he did mention that that's what prompted this request. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Other than that, that's it. Okay. And then when we do the project on Main Street, where where we end up with that, as we keep pursuing that, the council and myself, we want to keep pushing, even if it's just a small cap, all the way to Hardy Road on Main Street. Well, the um, Tri-County Regional Planning is the one that administers those kind of projects on behalf of MDOT. And they, they maintain what they call the TIP. It's the Transportation Something Plan. And the north half of Main Street is on the plan for, I believe, 2025. You're already in the rotation for getting an additional $375,000 from MDOT for that remaining part of the project. So. Um, those plans are done. They've been done for 12 years. We just had to split up the project into the south half and the north half. So it would just be a, simply a matter of going through the similar process of getting it out to bid. Yep. So. Would yeah. we still want to consider capping it? Yep. Two years? Step. Mm -hmm. So we would have did that. It would have been five years ago, and we'd be not worried about it right now. So. And that's simply because of the condition of the pavement it's there now, horrible. which is coming apart. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Along with our trucks. <laughs> yes. Trying to scrape the stump. Yes. <laughs> you want to cap it, or do you want to mill it and cap it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
the simpler, that faster, and quicker to just get it so that this is bad. Rather than doing it with the Main Street project, which is an MDOT project and gets complicated because it's MDOT, um, one of the things that we're going to be doing with respect to Apple Lane, because of the new water main that goes in, is we're gonna have some pavement work there. And it might be, might make sense to roll it in with that contract because there is going to be some milling and repaving for that. So that may be, um, it may be advantageous to roll it into that one. So I'll make note of that and we'll look at the possibility of doing that. I'm gonna push that. Okay. And there's a couple other uh, paving companies that could to do that along this even with Jason. So if Jason's too busy, wherever it would be. Well, he's going to have a sub that does it. Yep. So it'll be one of the pavement subs that do it, and uh, we can certainly have a discussion with them regarding that. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. That yeah, we'll appreciate that. We're going to yeah. keep going. So when somebody says, surprisingly, we're going to go home at 4 o'clock, we're going to continue on towards party. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, before we go on to new business, is there any advocate report or monitor improvement of pictures? Yeah, I'm still out there getting pictures. Yep. Because I not, not only is it important for everybody in the village to see, but that's part of our history when things are changing. So if you know cool. somebody in the school wants to do a report yep. 25 years down the road, they can look back on the pictures because it will be important. Yeah, the pictures by the hopefully the post office the pressure not there. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure watching. I'm trying to get I've got more pictures of the restaurant since they have the siding up and stuff. It's really looking nice. I just get out there and try and get them when I can. Because like I said, it is our history. We're a small village and I think that's important. Now Alan, I know you and I worked out over here in this parking lot, so when the millions start getting round up, we're gonna have some over here excavate it to make it level somewhat flat over here and get our road easement of our back lane and we're we'll using millings there to make Ingham County Drain Commission happy just using millings and then we'll share the, the labor of just get that fitted in so we can put the millings in there and make it look and we mentioned that before so we can do that so it's a parking lot with millings not flat top. Okay. You, you used an oxymoron there, Ingham County Drain Commission and Happy. Those two don't know. Oh. <laughs> well, well, Carla likes me. And she knows I do everything to make it correct. And I, I will let you deal with it. I'll deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Did they move into a new building yet? Pardon me? Did they move into their new building yet? The drain know. office won't be moving. Oh. You know. What's going to be moving into that building then? Uh, the, it's the jail and the sheriff. No, we were told that the Ingham County Drain uh, was going to move into a building out in front of Myers there and open the Smart Road to Grand Earth, mm -hmm. where the old Sagebrush building used to be. I know something you don't have. Oh, they're not moving there. The the Okama Consolidated Drainage District bought that building. That's the old Schuler's Bookstore. That's correct. Yeah, they're going to tear that down and build a stormwater detention basin there. Mm -hmm. well, that was backwards. Well, the, it, it, I don't know if you recall, but when you get about one inch of rain there in the neighborhood of the mall, that entire intersection floods. That's why they did all that. Yeah, it does. Grand, Grand River and Okemos. Yeah. And, and part of the reason is, is that when the mall and what is now the Best Buy, formerly the Kmart, and Myers were all built in 1968 and 1969, there was no stormwater management put in in any of that area. The mall alone has 67 acres of roof and pavement, and when it rains, that water just all runs off and it's not detained anywhere. And so that's why, in part, that all that flooding occurs. And so the drain office is in the process of doing a petition project on the Okemos Consolidated Drain to kind of revamp that whole drainage system. So okay. that, that there. They're not moving their office. They're going to tear that building down and dig a hole. Okay. Glad that was said correctly. <laughs> Thank you. All right. New business. Review conditional rezoning agreement. Chris Corey from McKenna Associates. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to hand out some thick packets of paper here. 
council member. Um, so Sam asked me tonight for the benefit of the entire council, but particularly those of you that are relatively new, to uh, recap the history of 4696 Grand River, aka the Ribbon site, aka the former, former Carter Lumber, aka the White Rose site, um, which has obviously been uh, the scene of a lot of drama uh, <laughs> for the past eight years or so and ongoing today. Um, you know, well, I, I'm, so if you bear with me, I want to walk through that and give everyone just an overview of where we've been and why we're experiencing what we're experiencing today, at which point we can discuss um, any action you want to take or don't want to take at this point um, with regard to the site other than what we're already doing. Um, when I wrap my history lesson, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jim and Scott a little bit to talk about where we're at today. Um, and Scott touched on that a little bit as well. All right. Uh, so obviously, prior to the timeline I'm about to walk through, this site was a Carter Lumber location, um, though that went out of business in the 90s, maybe a little later than that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it was vacant for over a decade. Um, at the time of 2015, summer 2015, when uh, a new owner was um, introduced to the village by the Livingston County Business Development Authority, um, or association, excuse me, uh, and, and brought us some ideas of um, doing some industrial manufacturing on the site uh, and reusing it in that way. I remember that being pretty exciting uh, for those of us in the room at the time. But what they wanted to do was not permitted under the zoning for the site, which was B2 general business. So the question was raised, should this be rezoned to an M1 industrial? Um, and while there was some appetite for that, there were some concerns about it. Um, one of the biggest ones is that M1 industrial is, it's your industrial district. It is the most intensive zoning district that you have. It allows a lot of things that you wouldn't want to see on Grand River. Uh, Additionally, that stretch of Grand River, and then as you come into the village, uh, you're starting to get some residential areas, you're starting to get into downtown, and there was concern about how much truck traffic the use might bring. Um, for, so for those reasons, uh, the village and the property owner entered into what's called a conditional rezoning agreement. What that is, is a document where a property owner voluntarily gives up some of the rights of a zoning district that they're interested in being zoned to in exchange for getting zoned to that district. In this case, the agreement prohibits some things that are listed here that would otherwise be allowed or allowed by a special use permit in the industrial district. And there are things like truck terminals, freight rail terminals, power plants, junkyards, extractive uses, sewage treatment, incinerators, and agriculture. I think it's fairly clear why those things were crossed out. Those would not be appropriate land uses on that piece of property. So they were voluntarily given up by the property owner. They're not allowed on that site. The conditional rezoning agreement also has a limitation on the amount of truck traffic that can go on and off that site or park on the site. Those two provisions are the core of that conditional rezoning agreement. It also has some other provisions that primarily restate rules that exist in the M1 district. The purpose of that was to provide clarity, so it's clear to everybody that these rules continue to apply and were not somehow waived. Ironically, those provisions that restate things that are already in the M1 district have caused confusion over the years, including the uh, misunderstanding that it is the conditional rezoning agreement that imposes those rules, not the zoning ordinance itself. The biggest one of that, which will come up repeatedly here, is outdoor storage. In the M1 zoning district, in fact, anywhere in the village, you need to get a special use permit, which is awarded by this council on a discretionary basis based on the criteria in the zoning ordinance, uh, prior to operating a business that requires outdoor storage. That's not, if that provision is discussed in the conditional rezoning agreement, but it doesn't originate there. I want to make sure that's, that's clear because this has been argued about. Um, so the village did not impose any additional limitation on outdoor storage. 
It just is, it, there is one already in place that is described in the conditional rezoning agreement. So, September 11th, 2015, that conditional rezoning agreement was approved by this council. There is a signed version, I believe Scott has it. Um, the, there's an unsigned version in the packet I gave you. Additionally, there's a version in the packet later on because since 2015, there's been a renumbering in the zoning ordinance. It was requested by American Legal. Um, so some subsections that, were, that had numbers now have letters. And that has caused some confusion with this conditional rezoning agreement. So one of the things you have in your packet is actually a version of it that labels the correct up-to-date references as far as references to the zoning ordinance. I wanted to go into that level of detail with that particular document just because it's sort of the crux of all of this. The one other thing, uh, before I move on from I do want to say one other thing. That document also has provisions by which it, it can be voided by the village council. Um, and, and those are listed in, in, the, uh, in the agreement, and they're things like ongoing violations of the ordinance or the agreement on the site. So we'll set that aside for the moment and keep moving through time. Uh, so after that uh, agreement was signed, um, the uh, ownership over at the, at the site started doing uh, a little bit of construction over there and started moving in which unfortunately was not the right thing to do because that agreement, while it opened the door to do certain things, did not represent a final approval, right? There's still zoning uh, requirements to get site plan approval and the exterior uh, site improvements that are required by that. And perhaps more importantly, there's also a requirement to get a building permit and bring the interior of the buildings up to the building code for the use that's proposed. That didn't happen in the winter of 2015 and it frankly hasn't, for the most part, happened since, right? Uh, so we get to spring 2016. Uh, things have been going on on that site. Jim is trying to figure out what's going on and threatening to issue tickets. And so uh, we sat down with the, uh, the ownership over there uh, on was May 3rd, 2016. I was able to find the exact date. Uh, at that meeting, we laid out the process for them to get the site legal and ready to be used, right? Uh, the first step in that process was a site plan approval. Uh, that's a zoning approval. Um, we agreed with them that it could be administrative. It didn't have to come to council. It would just run through McKenna, and we would uh, review it against the zoning ordinance and sign off on it. Uh, a site plan was submitted, and it was actually approved administratively on July 14th, 2016. That site plan is still the site plan that governs the site today. Now. A couple times in this narrative, that site plan was superseded by another one that was approved. Everything that where that's happened has subsequently been voided. So the one approved in 2016 is still the one in, uh, uh, in effect today. Now, beyond that, the only thing that they got certificates of occupancy for was what's called cold storage, correct, Jim? In 2015, I issued them a certificate of occupancy to use the buildings for the owner's own use for cold storage. Yeah. Um, the owner approached and said he wants to store stuff in his building. We said, we gave him the opportunity, I gave him an a certificate of occupancy to store his own materials inside the building. Um, and I think their own materials is a key word there. If, basically, if you own a building, you can store your stuff in it. That's not operating a business. That's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't even require heat or electricity or anything. Right? You just put your stuff in it. That's the level of approval on the building side they got um, at that time. Meanwhile, while this was happening, the state legislature approved uh, a, a law that legalized medical marijuana in Michigan. Uh, the village council's response at that time was to opt in to allowing medical marijuana uses, uh, like growing and processing, et cetera, within the village, but with limitations. And the primary, the biggest one of those limitations was that those uses had to be in the M1 zoning district, they had to be west of Elm Road, and they had to get a special use permit. Right? Because this piece of property was in the M1 district at that time, or it still is, was in the M1 district and it was west of Elm Road, it became eligible for a special use permit for marijuana. Uh, and I'll come back to where that leads in a second. So January 2017, the Village Council 
approves this ordinance that allows marijuana for all that. But before any application comes forward for medical marijuana on that site, we got an application for outdoor storage. This is because outdoor storage had been ongoing because the storage was in the buildings. It started to spill out of the buildings. We asked them to try to get a special use permit for outdoor storage in the vicinity of the buildings. Um, and that request was denied by the Village Council. In March of 2017, Village Council voted no. They could not do outdoor storage on that site. Um, subsequently, pretty soon after that actually, there was interest in that site from a couple of guys who wanted to do medical marijuana growing and processing. Uh, they applied for a special use permit and they were approved in October of 2017. Subsequently, uh, approximately a year went by. No construction began on the site. Um, repeated inquiries to the applicant, repeated inquiries to the landlord, went nowhere. Uh, it turned out they had some sort of disagreement amongst themselves. Um, ultimately, we came up to the one year mark. Now, as some of you know, when the village approves marijuana uses, it puts a one year check in into the approval. One year after the approval, the, they're required to come back in front of you guys to be discuss you know, how things are going, whether they're having issues with their neighbors, how their build out's going, et cetera. Um, and the village council generally has um, you know, taken that information and renewed those businesses and allowed them to keep going. In this case, there had been no progress made at all. The village council, out of uh, seeing that and being, frankly, based on the stuff I was just reading to prep for this, being unsure whether the landlord even wanted that tenant there voided the approval. So that the medical marijuana growing and processing business that was supposed to be there was no longer approved um, and, and would not be moving onto the site. Right around the same time that that approval had to be voided because nothing was happening, we got an application from what's called Secure Transporter. Uh, which is something that's allowed under the Michigan's marijuana laws, which is basically literally someone who can transport marijuana legally. They're licensed to do that. Um, one of the things they need for their licensure, um, as Brad knows, is a piece of property that is their distribution um, office, where they park their trucks, et cetera. Someone applied um, in fall of 2018 to do that on 4696 Grand River. They didn't have the signature of the property owner, though. That's a requirement for a special use permit. We need to know if the person who owns the property is on board with you applying for this, right? So that's a requirement. They did not have that signature. Um, they disappeared. They did not return until May, late May, May 30th, when they finally submitted an application with the property owner's signature. So they showed up in September. They didn't have the signature. And then all the way through the winter, we didn't hear from them. They came back May 30th and submitted this. That's going to be important. Again, meanwhile, the November 2018 election happened, and on that ballot was a referendum to allow recreational marijuana in Michigan. Of course, that passed. The Village Council, that following winter and spring, had several meetings where you guys discussed how we're going to respond to this with our ordinance, which currently requires uh, marijuana uses to be medical in nature. Uh, the eventual decision was, from the village's standpoint, it doesn't, we can't really tell the difference. We don't have the enforcement capacity to know if this is medical or recreational marijuana. Uh, so an, an ordinance was adopted to allow both with functionally the same rules. One of the provisions of that new ordinance, which again encompassed all marijuana uses, medical or recreational, was adding one more geographic condition to where you could do it. And that geographic condition was that medical, or excuse me, marijuana uses generally were not allowed anywhere on Grand River regardless of zoning district. So what that meant is that 4696 Grand River, previously eligible for marijuana, was no longer eligible for marijuana. Now importantly, that decision was not specifically related to that site. It applies to the entire road all the way through the village. Right? This is an exclusion from your main drag for marijuana uses. Uh, but obviously it did have the effect of changing the rules for this particular site. And right around the same time that that was adopted is when we finally got the application back for the secure transporter with the signature on it. Um, he waited just a little bit too long. By the time his public hearing was scheduled in front of this council, 
the ordinance that had been adopted was effective and he was no longer allowed on that site at all, so that application was denied. So we've now reached summer of 2019. Things got pretty quiet on the site. Uh, yeah, Brad? He denied for that area, but if he found a, an area in our industrial park, mm -hmm. he was able to go forward. That is true. I don't know if that particular person did that, but you're right. And I think that was, I, that was expressed some at the time, if I remember correctly. His name was Gary Mischler. Yeah. And then, so we, we said, your application, although we'd be more welcome to have you, is no longer to be on Grand River. You're more welcome, available property in the industrial park. Yep. I, I remember that was expressed to him. I don't know that he followed up with that, but that was expressed to him. Um, and we have approved secure transporters in the industrial park. Um, and we've done so with a right. relatively minimal setup. True. Um, where you know you could you put a lot in a little office and, and you, you can just park there. This is what we've approved. But not for that particular individual, I don't think they followed up on that. The state of Michigan, though, when you get a permit to be a grower or a processor, it goes to the people that actually are doing the business, mm -hmm. not the property owner. That's true. Okay. Yeah. You can go forward now, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that Jonathan and Andrew had their permit. Yeah. And then they could go where they could get property to go with their processing. Yeah, and that's true. And I didn't mention that is that they the guys who want to do medical marijuana at 4696 Grand River, when that didn't work out, they went to the industrial park. Now that did not work out either, but they were approved in another location in the industrial park by the village. That's um, correct. They kept that would have been aid instruction, etc. Permit. Um, then COVID hit and not much happened for a while. Uh, but then in January of 2021, um, Jim was doing his usual code enforcement rounds and took some pictures over at the site. Um, he sent them to me um, and I compiled a list of violations that I saw of the zoning ordinance um, and, and Jim issued a ticket. That January 2021 ticket is what Scott was talking about earlier that has now been appealed. Just to say two years later, we're still fighting about it. Um, so that is, even though we prevailed at the uh, district level, correct? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is ongoing. Uh, there was a little bit of a uh, reset in August of 2021 when McKenna was asked to, okay, what's going on over there? And we provided a fairly detailed report, um, which is now fairly out of date because it's been 18 months since then. Uh, but one of the things we found was that uh, it was out of compliance with the 2016 site plan approval. The improvements on that site plan had never been uh, implemented, although stay tuned on that. We also determined there was a U-Haul business on that site, which had never gotten any approval, and that at that time there was continuing outdoor storage. Uh, a year after that, August of 2022, the U-Haul business came in for a special use approval. Um, that was approved but it was approved with a tight timeline for um, compliance and implementation because of well, everything I've just gone through. Uh, it was, they were given 120 days to build out what was required. They did do some things, and the big thing they did was plant trees on the fence line. Now, by so, doing that, yeah. So sorry to interrupt, but for those of us who weren't around is, I think the council was originally, and McKenna was proposing 365 days for compliance, and. Uh, the proposed tenant was actually the one who suggested the 128 days. That's correct, yeah. That they said they could get it done faster. Right. Um, now, the fact that they planted those trees along the fence line, and they're little bitty trees, but the, the fact that they planted along the fence line uh, actually brings the site into compliance with the 2016 site plan. That does not solve a lot of other issues, but it does apparently solve that one. However, they did not meet everything they were supposed to meet by December 7th of 2022, and they were subsequently kicked off the site. Uh, for not being approved. Um, so that's where my timeline ends. Um, however, there have been some continuing enforcement and, and legal actions if you guys want to take the narrative from here. Yeah, well. well, I have to be careful in everything I say because there is ongoing litigation going there. But I can say uh, at that property, uh, we've had uh, the U-Haul 
facility move in there. Jay Ribbon has his own manufacturing fabrication shop inside the building. And then we had an RV repair facility one move in, a guy that a young kid that does RV roof repairs in the in the same building. Now my Building official responsibilities are enforce the building code. The building code is very specific. When this was Carter Lumber, they had in the building code they have listings of uses in Chapter Three. Uses are designations given to particular type of businesses or operations so they can meet certain code requirements in the building code. And those vary from anything from business use to factory use to industrial use to high hazard use to storage use. Now, when Carter Lumber was there, they had a, a use designation when the certificate of occupancy was issued, which was a B use, which is business, which was for that front office area, then an S use, which is storage for the, the pool bar so they can store their lumber. Now, if those designations stay for the life of the building. As long as the use doesn't change, they're allowed to keep using that. That's how come we're able to give them cold storage in those buildings because it's an SU. Storage are able to use that. But the minute they start bringing other types of operations or uses into a building, that kicks in the building code requirements where now they have to meet the current code requirements for that use. And if you have a multi-use building, like we do for one building where we had the U-Haul, the fabrication shop, and the RV, they, that whole building has to meet the requirements of the most stringent use. For that building. And that's been our argument with them ongoing. But they refuse to give us building plans. They refuse to make any renovations inside those buildings. What they do do is stuff on weekends without getting permits. Apparently, there's been walls built inside the units and electrical run and other things run inside these buildings that were done without permits. So they cannot occupy those buildings without proper certificate of occupancy, and they cannot occupy those buildings for the use they're doing without renovating them to the state that they're supposed to be in. Um, it's down for the storage out there, the Gen 2 plastic that has the storage there. Uh, our fire marshal went out, there's actually a code section that says once it gets over 12 feet in height, that has to be suppressed. Our fire marshal went out he says he went and taped it, it was like 11 foot, five inches, so it was under 12 foot, so he had no power to do it. But also, now those boxes, as Sam has noted, are, because they're exposed to weather, are getting wet, they're collapsing, they're falling over. They actually now have story, part of their argument there is, they're saying that those shed type roofs is not outdoor storage. They're saying that that's indoor storage because it has a shed roof over it. My interpretation is it's outside. <laughs> if you're exposed to the weather, you're outside. Just because you're a roof over something doesn't mean you're indoors. That's outdoor. And now also they're storing stuff in the back of the lot, not even underneath the shed roofs. Years ago, uh, Mr. Ripman agreed and actually got a permit for enclosing those areas, and he never followed through with them. Uh, he's never repaired his dumpster enclosure in the back. Now that, I believe, now Chris, correct me, that was part of the site plan approval that they have a proper dumpster and, and it's never been proper. They never brought it up to the requirements that they're supposed to have. So yeah, that's correct. They made some progress but never actually did. built it the way that it was drawn the plan or required to be built by the zoning ordinance. So it, it's my opinion that they're occupying that place, those areas illegally. The storage is under the definition and our attorney has actually said that although we do not have a definition of our ordinance of what outdoor storage is, there's actually a precedent and actual description of what a outdoor storage is. Um, so that plastic storage can't be there, their use can't be there, and he's made no effort to try to comply. In fact, when one uh, business fails and moves out, another one moves back in, I catch it and find it. It's just ongoing. I mean, if I was to go, there used to be a, a, a small operation in uh, Little Dusty's there on the west side of the building where a guy had a little shop and they had a little workshop and he worked on a, a racing four-wheeler he had in there. 
But since then, I believe that's moved out. Uh, I see a lot of trucks parked there, a lot of trailers using the entrance there, so I'm sure there's another business in there. Uh, I'm careful about how I go onto that property. As a matter of fact, I kind of refrain myself going on property because there was a suit brought saying that I'm trespassing and they put ropes up on a certain part of that property where I can't go in. If I was to go in, I'd have to remove the rope and go and I'd want to open myself up to another lawsuit for what they call trespassing, even though we've had a judge say that with that particular area, that's not really trespassing. I just don't want to open myself up to that. So that's where we're at as far as, from a building standpoint, where we're at. So then on the law side of things, uh, how this works is that Jim writes a ticket, uh, serves on the, the party that's violating the building code and zoning or whatnot, and then that ticket then goes to the 55th District Court and it's held as an informal hearing. It's like a speeding ticket. I don't know if anyone's ever challenged a speeding ticket, but effectively you, without representation, without an attorney, can go in front of the magistrate, the police officer is supposed to stand there and you know, vouch for what he's seen and, and, and the speeding ticket example he would have said I've seen so-and-so speeding well it's the same process with this building code or zoning uh, a tickets issued mr. Wright represents the village at that point it's informal so it's in front of the magistrate the party that's grieved shows up and has to defend um, now uh, what's happened with this particular set of facts is that uh, we we had an informal they didn't show Right. They did not show they being White Rose and Jay Rippon, and so it was automatically defaulted. Um, the Rippon got an attorney, the, the attorney um, overturned the default, which is very common. The courts, as a, as a rule, try to hear the arguments. They don't like defaults because it usually leaves things unsettled. So. Ritman brings in an attorney, the, inter the attorney uh, unwinds the default, and then goes to a formal hearing. That's when the village then, um, through their attorney, which is me at this time, represented the village, Jay Ritman was there with his attorney, and we had a hearing. To give you some perspective, zoning issues, building issues, if you have a four hour hearing on a matter like that, that is almost extreme. We had six days of litigation with this. And a lot of it was uh, the defense attorney arguing with the judge over various procedural matters. And I mean, I think there's 24 pages dedicated of the transcript dedicated to uh, whose definition of trespass was correct. It, it, it was just a unique circumstance. You sprinkle in there that we had, we still had some issues with COVID. Uh, so the hearing dates got moved out quite a bit of time, uh, multiple times. Um, anyway, by the time we got to hearing number six, uh, the judge ruled in our favor. In fact, our code, if I recall, the, we're, the, the, the citations were saying a uh, $150 fine for each infraction. Um, but the judge had the power by way of state statute to raise that raise it up to $500 per ticket. And the judge did that on his own accord because of what he heard. Um, so effectively, Jay Rittman, White Rose Realty, uh, is responsible for $500 on both those tickets. Subsequent to that, Jay Rittman, through his attorney, has now appealed the circuit court. The circuit court then reviews the transcripts, they review the briefs. I had to file a brief in response to Jay Rittman's attorney's brief. Um, and Oral argument is has been requested by both parties. I did in, uh, in large part just because uh, uh, Rittman's attorney did. I didn't want to, if they were going to make an oral argument, I wanted to make sure that we preserved our rights to have our oral argument in front of uh, Judge Wanda Stokes. Um, it is possible that the court could just rule uh, upon reviewing the briefs and the transcripts. Um, and probably likely, because this matter is so contentious, they will have oral argument. That day, I'm not sure when it will be. However, um, it, however the circuit court rules should conclude the matter. There, there's no other appeal or relief available to someone in this situation. So an answer is forthcoming. Um, I don't know how busy the docket is per se, but uh, uh, 
you know, I would hope that we could get something within a month, a court date, a ruling, something for some guidance. Um, when I now keep in mind, civil infractions, it's not criminal law. It's 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 truly civil litigation is what it is, and so there's different rules to it. But that um, ultimately, the way I see this thing is that if once if, if provided that the circuit court rules in our favor again, as the the district court did, that would show for any future tickets that is related to all this, that hey, we have the courts on our side, they're ruling with us, you guys are in violation. Um, I feel like that's a prudent way of going about this because hypothetically, if the circuit court were to say no, if the district court was wrong, then now we're kind of back to the drawing board again. Now, even if the district or the circuit court rules against us, um, that doesn't take away our ability to cite Jay Rittman and White Rose for subsequent future violations or ongoing violations. Um, to me, I just, if, anyone, if you understand what I'm saying, is that if we get the rubber stamp by circuit court, to me, that carries a lot of weight for subsequent violations. Okay, so that's like a, pre you're setting a precedent. That's what we're hoping for, is okay. that, that circuit court says, yes, the district court was right, there's no question these were violations. Gotcha. Um, I th we have tickets that have been issued since the district court ruling. Mm -hmm. um, those are set for informal. Yeah, March uh, March twenty second, I go before them for two tickets uh, for uh, outdoor storage and for occupying without a certificate of occupancy. Those we, tickets got pushed back. They we made a decision that I was going to write tickets every week, and then the judge got upset about seeing so many tickets come through. So the tickets I wrote got pushed ahead to now, we were hoping that these tickets would have got rolled into the circuit court, but the circuit court judge denied that. So I'm forced to go on the 22nd for another informal hearing on these two civil infraction tickets. I don't know where that's gonna go. I, I might, I was gonna talk to Scott and see if we might, well, I was gonna talk to Scott about it. Yeah, and so there was an effort to try and consolidate all these new tickets into the current litigation. Um, I think the timing of it, benefit of hindsight, we got so far down the road in the first round of tickets and the litigation there that I believe, I'm reading the tea leaves here, that the court must have felt that factually things could have been different, that you couldn't just bundle them all up together because there could be different circumstances for different violations. So I think that's part of the reason why they may have pulled them apart and said, no, we're not going to consolidate everything. Um, but again, I think if, if we can show a pattern and a behavior uh, through circuit court, uh, you know, hopefully with the ruling in our favor, it'll add some weight to subsequent tickets. Because at least the courts will be on notice as to who they're dealing with between us and Britain. So. Um, and I'll wrap us up here by um, if it's the village council's pleasure to um, revoke a conditional rezoning agreement. I'm not saying it is, but if, if that's something you wanted to pursue, uh, you have to schedule a public hearing because it is a zoning change. Um, and then the appropriate zoning to change to would be B2, which is what it was before. Um, the practical impact of that from a zoning perspective is that Mr. Rippman's fabrication shop and the plastics business would no longer be allowed on the site. The other businesses that have uh, op are operating or have expressed interest in operating would still have the opportunity to operate. Their um, process that they'd have to go through under the zoning ordinance would vary by business, You know, might be more or less difficult, but they would still have an opportunity. The fabrication of plastics would not be allowed at all. Um, and none of that changes the building code issues, which are simply that those buildings have never been brought up to the code for what they're being used for. Um, with that, <laughs> we're interested in hearing uh, council's direction on this on this issue. I guess I'll I'll start on that, and, and the whole reason why I invited Chris here today. Thank you, all three of you. I know that was uh, a very lengthy process to go over all, all of this history, but I think it was uh, beneficial and, and prudent with the timing of the 
uh, ongoing litigation is when I looked at, at our zoning, I saw the conditional rezoning agreement and I reached out to Chris and basically said, what is this? Uh, and when he sent me the document, um, there's specific verbiage in here, which I interpreted uh, section two, in the event that any of the following occur, this agreement shall be void and the site shall revert to B2, zoning district. Uh, those conditions are the site is used for uh, a use that is not permitted under this agreement. Uh, I think there's been now multiple instances of that. Uh, no use permitted under this agreement operates on the site for a period of uh, six months, or the use of the site is determined to be out of compliance with any of the standards in this agreement or any applicable standards zoning ordinance. I read that as this should have been reverted to B2 years ago. Uh, now, obviously the council has not has chosen not to exercise um, that ability. And, you know, for me to see a conditional agreement floating out here in the air for eight years that we're not really abiding by, the other party's not abiding by, uh, we either need to take action on this or basically dissolve it and, you know, grant the M1 permanently, which other implications that, that Chris and I talked about is and that, that's again why I invited Chris in so um, I have my own opinions about it um, my biggest concern all along with the outdoor storage has been those containers getting weathered and toppling and they have in fact um, a few days ago I noticed that some had fallen over in the recent snowstorm I took a picture and sent it to, to Chris and Jim uh, those have remained there and have been snowed on for many days now and you know this is kind of out, I understand this part is outside of our ordinance uh, but my entire personal career has been in the plastics industry uh, I work with many businesses such as Gen 2 uh, and I think it's very reasonable to assume uh, that they are pulverizing plastics and of course because the occupants aren't really cooperating, we really don't know the full nature of that business. <clears throat> One of my biggest concerns with that outdoor storage in the first place and then it falling and not being uh, picked up in any sort of way is the potential for any sort of microplastics that have been pulverized to then enter our local waterways, uh, posing other environmental hazards. So that's outside of our ordinance. Uh, you know, my opinion for what it's worth is I think the village is more than within its right to stand by this agreement and go back to a B2 zoning. That's my take. Any other council members? I probably just want to say that I agree with what Sam is saying right now. We have been working on this for eight years. And just this simple site plan agreement has not even been fully complied with. So that's my take for what it's worth. Don't look at my patience. Scott, <laughs> well, can you, yeah. like, I know Jim Wright and Scott Gould and Chris Corey, it's changed each time. It's not been one certain way he's trying to structure something. There's different places that go in there. So with the eight years and what you're trying to explain, each time this has changed. It's not been the same exact thing. So it's not right to say, other than it could go back to B2, but in the meantime, you have obligations of what already has been in the role and in fact the village of Waterville has not dragged this out. No. It's the other system. Not no. The village of Waterville. And I'm not saying that the, that the village has, has dragged this out by any means and, uh, and in, in part of the conversation that I had with Chris is that I think you know d despite my opinion on the matter is I, I think it is still premature to take any action on this. I think it, it is worth it to let the current litigation settle um, and, and see where that ruling stands before 
doing anything. Um, but given that that is on the immediate horizon, I felt it was important to have Chris come in and educate the council on the complete history so that way when the dust settles, a more informed decision can be made. So, I appreciate your input. I haven't read this whole thing, but on one hand, if we're holding them accountable, we also have to abide by what we're writing. Right. That's what you pay the county associates for. <laughs> I understand. And Jim I, writes our ordinance office. I, I understand. And, and Jim ordinances actually follow protocol. I understand. And then when we get that person to comply, he changes it. Correct. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that correct? Well, yes, but I think it's my answer to that. Yeah, I know. All right, the village of Weberville is not the ones that are trying to drag this out. We want that's, them to that's go forward yes. correctly <laughs> and have them be within compliance of the project of being in the district they're in right now that they asked for when they, when they came in there. That's all we're doing. Yeah. I will say that from my perspective, has he ever came to us and said he wants to go back to B? No, no. although I think it's worth noting that we had to kick a tenant out, right, that would have been allowed under B2 recently. Yeah. Um, so that, that has happened now, <laughs> We've had, where someone has had been negatively impacted as far as a potential business on that site. Um, but I think, Brad, that the reason I said yes, but, is that we've had a recurring problem since the beginning with things being stored outside which is again they asked for your permission to do that and you guys said no and we told them hey that was six years ago you can or you know four years ago was five years ago we told them repeatedly you could come ask again and see if they changed their mind this time or if there's different circumstances or a different uh, you know proposal they haven't been willing to do that they are storing different things outside <laughs> And, and that's actually been one of the things that's been making litigation take forever is because they'll say, well, we, maybe we took it back one minute after you took the picture. What is that? Sorry. So, it, but, but after eight years, that becomes a recurring pattern of the same violation. And again, I don't think any of us are advocating one way or another for whether you guys should take action on the agreement, on section two of the agreement, other than to say that it, the agreement gives you that power, mm -hmm. right? Um, but there may be other options, and there were reasons why you approved the agreement in the first place. Well, and that's where, you know, to my point, and I think what you were maybe alluding at, Lana, is, you know, yes, we're the village is not trying to drag this out, but by the agreement and per this history, you know, back in 2017 and 2018, when there was a violation of outdoor storage, by the agreement, that gives the village the power to go back to B2 because that is a violation of the agreement that they signed. Yes, Jim. No matter what agreement or what decision is made, we're dealing with Mr. Rippon. And Mr. Rippon does not want to agree with anything this village decides they want to do. And that's the problem. We can say we're putting back to B2, you can, we can make whatever zoning laws you want to be, but Mr. Rippon is not going to comply with that. I can tell you that. And I can tell you right now, he's setting up with different conversations we've had over the phone and email that's come from different businesses there. And he's setting the village up for a lawsuit. Uh, so whatever actions we take, we have to be concise and we have to be unified and have some sort of plan made so that we can execute whatever action we're going to take. Because Mr. Ribbon will not comply the main decision that's made in this room. That's been my experience with him over eight years. Uh, he's gone through multiple attorneys to find different attorneys they can have to bring in. Uh, his plan is to drag this out. He has the funds to drag this out as long as he can to wear the village down to get what he wants. And what precisely is it that he wants? He wants to do what he wants to do on his piece of property with whoever he wants to be there. He wants it his way. Mm -hmm. You know, he is running there uh, 
He has a junkyard there. He has busted up vehicles there. He has old farm equipment store there. He has open container store there. Whoever is willing to pay him a nickel to store something and put it there, he's let them put there. But that's what he wants. That's what he wants to do there. He wants to be able to put whoever he wants in there without having to make the building safe, without having to invest any money in the house, in the property. He wants to collect as much funds as he can there without putting any investment into the property. Okay. And then even to that point is you know, something that, that Chris said uh, many meetings ago at this point is I'm of the opinion, and I think the, the, the village council has been of the opinion that we are being friendly towards a mixed use property. You know, being that there's a plastics recycler, there's manufacturing, there's, you know, uh, the Little Dusty's retail business. That's fine. We just want to know what's going on and to ensure the, the safety of the occupants that are on site. Absolutely. Is really what it comes down to. You know, so yes, do whatever you want, but tell us what you're doing and you know, make sure that it's safe. That's all it is. Yes, Mr. Jack. In your packet I have included uh, an email that came from the owner of Gen 2 Plastic who's just ranting yep. on and on about stuff. But once again, you know, he's threatening lawsuits against me to take me to the attorney general if I pursue with different violations or, or more uh, citations against the property. This is the same gentleman who in court testified that he had nothing to do with that property. So uh, Mr. Ripman has connections with different business owners and they more or less are in collusion together to try to accomplish what Mr. Ripman wants to do there, which is as I said, whatever he wants to do on that property, no matter what we try to do. So with our lawyer Scott Gould and Jim Wright, our ordinance officer with McKenna Associates, do you believe the next 30 to 45 days that we're going to get the court system to resolve either or party so we can get some type of thing in writing or get it adjusted so this can go forward without having this keep recurring? I think we can get this settled. And this next go around, the last, this is the last hurrah that should rule it, yes or no, correct? It should, but the it should. circuit court now, kind of like what Jim was saying. You know. I understand, but we'd like to be done with it and get it gone. Yes, Mr. Jim. The thing you have to keep in mind, what he's appealing in circuit court are two silver fractions that I wrote for a dumpster and was it open storage? Outdoor storage. Outdoor storage. That's the two things being appealed there. So if we win that in that court, the circuit court says you got to do this. The only thing he has to do is eliminate the outdoor storage and fix his dumpster. It's not going to fix anything else on that site. Okay. So, so any other violations going forward, it's back to ground zero, as Scott said. Even if we win this, we've got a precedent. I'm still going to have to go forward with writing to try to get these buildings brought out to try to keep that property stay, try to get the property parking spaces he needs in there because you know these businesses come in they have to go for site plan approval they have to meet the parking requirements there's a whole list of things depending on what business he brings it in so even if we win this case great we won this case but we're still back to ground zero in trying to do anything on that property and some of the other things they're matching the judge and the magistrate you see this that's, that's not being done correctly too correct even though there's not a citation I'm sure it's been brought up in the conversations when you guys have the meetings. Or, right? Well, I mean, we have to stay focused on the, the tickets at hand, oh. but uh, I'm sure that anyone that was sitting in there and listened to what was being said would glean from it that there's other problems here. And I, and I think we're, like I was going to say, as to what Jim was saying about even if we do away with conditional zoning agreement. Right, we say it's B2. You violated it. Circuit Court ruled in our favor. We're pulling back the conditional zoning. The track record would suggest that we we make that B2 and we're gonna have the same problem. So then I think we gotta elevate just how serious we're gonna get, including red tagging and chain and doors, which is the most draconian way of getting someone's attention. And it's you gotta be very careful when you do that. You have to Make sure everything is just right on the legal side of things because effectively if you're wrong someone's door has been locked inappropriately but that's where this is going is that 
I, I don't know how else, it, short of Jay changing his mind and changing on a, uh, his character post circuit court ruling, I think we got to start looking down, down the road as how far can we push this thing? And I think it comes to red tag. And Joe will feel every bit of it. I mean, he'll go to the court, he'll go to the next court, to the next court. I mean, part of his arguments in court was that the picture sites so weren't on the day of the citation was written, so he's trying to get the pictures taken out. Even though I had pictures taken before the citation, pictures the day of the citation, picture after the citation, try to show history, his attorney was arguing you can't bring those to the court, only the ones on the day of the citation, and you can't prove those dates. These are the type of arguments he was having. So, I mean, regardless of what we do, this is going to be happening. My point being is, we're, this is a long haul. We're, we're not nowhere near where we're going to be. This is going to be ongoing because Mr. Way, Mr. Whitman works with his attorneys and appeals every, every day. I, I will say this, and this is not a recommendation either way, but without the conditional rezoning agreement, Mr. Rittman's business and the plastics business are not permitted under zoning. And the, the, the one thing about that is it's a very black and white, clear rule. It's not, your business is allowed, but this, that, it, that is not an allowed use. That's not either here nor there necessarily, but it does provide clarity. But we have to wait for this case to be settled first. You don't have to. I know that. It, I, I think it's a reasonable position to say let's wait until this case is resolved and then see what happens next, for sure. But you don't have to do that. And I think with the plastics and with the fabrication thing, his, uh, his uh, argument is going to be that it was approved before, so it's pre-existing, non-conforming. So he's going to come back saying that that's, you know, just because you changed the zoning ordinance, I was, it was okay when I first went in there. Even though it was there illegally, he's gonna, that's going to be his argument. And now we're arguing again about whether it's okay. Right. It's a good point, Jim. So okay. even if you do that, I don't think you're going to get them out of there because he's going to argue that that's pre, it was pre-existing, not conforming, was allowed at the time that they went in there. So, you know, uh, even if we use like we, the nuclear option, the V2, I think you're still not going to get anywhere to get them out of there because he's going to use that pre-existing, not conforming. I mean, it, it, but it was still an, an illegal operation to begin with. So I mean, we have a leg to stand on that regard. But I mean, is there any sort of, uh, I guess, like industrial squatters rights or, you know? Jim is correct that a principle of zoning is that if you're legal, and then the community, the village in this case, takes this action with zoning to make you illegal, you still are legal. Right. But if you weren't legal to begin with, you don't retain those rights. But now, as Jim's correct, we're going to be arguing about whether or not they were legal to begin with. But there's still an abundance of proof that that is the case, though, right? I mean, we don't know. It. I think, actually, some aspects, certainly the outdoor storage aspect. Mm -hmm. But I think other aspects, a fabrication shop is allowed, zoning-wise, on that site. That's legal. Per special use permit, though, right? Not with not after fabrication shop. Okay. But our understanding is well, not not our understanding that fabrication shop is in a building that is not up to code for fabrication under the building code. Under the building code. Now we have a building code issue and a zoning issue that are going in opposite directions. It's, this is it is hard to get out of the complexity here. No matter what you do. And that's what he plays on in the court with the attorneys. So we need to have clear, good direction, and if whatever direction we've got to take, we've got to use the big hammer on it and just came down with it and be ready for whatever comes from it. Because it's not going to be, it's not going to be inexpensive. It's going to take some time. Well, that, to me, I feel like that's kind of what I'm hearing and the conclusion that I'm coming to is we can continue on the path that we've been on and it be an ongoing issue and a slow bleed, if you will, or exercise of to your words, Jim, the, the nuclear option, it will probably get ugly, but at the end of the day, it'll probably have some resolution to it. And we won't continue to have these problems. It sucks either way. Well, I wish there was something where I can find something that I can condemn their property or some loophole or somewhere thing there that I can find that can just say, you know, you have to leave. 
you know, but I, I, there isn't anything in there. I mean, it's all minor stuff, they're huge stuff. Minor, so many minor things just turn into a big thing, but it, there's nothing big that I can say, you gotta go. And I wish there was something that I had that I could say that. I've contacted the state of Michigan, the head building official of the state of Michigan with this. You know, I stay awake at night thinking about this particular site, you know, and it's a... Uh, well, and quite frankly, I do too, is, you know, in my opinion, it's it's a, it's a kindling box or a tinder box waiting to go off. I mean, the unapproved electrical, the condition of the outdoor storage, I mean, it's, it's an industrial-sized fire waiting to happen, and it is upwind of our grain silos. And yeah, it's not as close as the outdoor burning that, that occurred, you know, on a different property not too long ago, but that keeps me up at night knowing that something could happen there that could affect the entire community. I'll take a stern there. No. I have to believe this much longer, but just so you know, the fire marshal, I've tried multiple times and I have gotten success that our fire marshal going there and walked the building and he said that the buildings are safe from a fire for Really? Interesting. Do I agree with that? Uh, but that's, he walked through there. So Scott Gould, our attorney, our lawyer, you need to go in there and uh, get this, this next program and see what happens on that. As to the circuit court room or? Up to Circuit court ruling? Yep, yep. Okay. See how, how you feel when you get in there and you feel that the, you just can't get no uh, feeling that the village of Warrow is going to have any support, then let us see. Oh, um, I'll tell you at this point, I do think the courts are on our side. I think they do see the violation as blatant. I think it's just we got to get through the formality, unfortunately. Oh, let's see, we can, let's see what that does. If they, if they goes in the right direction and we'll, we'll go from there. But yes, I would like to have it not keep going forward. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Go ahead and do that. Yes. Thank you. Get that pulled up, Chris. Thank you for coming. We're going to move to, as long as the council members are ready, we move to the next program we got on our list. We good? Yep. All right. So our ORS State Employment DB, it's Act 88, uh, Retirement Act of 1961. Do we want to uh, recommend that this is uh, adopted, or how does the council feel? Can I get an explanation of what it is? Yeah. So, so basically, if they have time in at like a school or another place that counted. Mm -hmm. It comes in to here at the village, so for them to be vested. Gotcha. So, like if they were to in another town or, or school or, or place where okay, where we work, yeah, where they get MERS. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So many years. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have it counted for their being vested here. Gotcha. Okay. Sure, it carries over. Yeah, we yes. got. I want to stop. Alan Boyer, we, we good on everything you think? We're good forward. Thank you, Mr. Jim Wright, Scott Gould, Chris Lori. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. For, so I want to make sure I answer any questions, but thank you, Alan. Do you have one of your new cards, your new business cards? So, like, Greg, you work for a school. Mm -hmm. And those so years ago, Marine City just hired me. And so he will be able to get vested in. Yeah. Oh, he should have, so he, if we would have had this already, mm -hmm. here, he would have so been. So if, if we adopt this, would this be retroactive? He 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 he'll get a move bill too. It'll automatically It'll automatically yes. go. That way? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Nice. Sorry about that. I'll make sure I get it. Um, so, so we uh, so like with Greg working at the village, mm -hmm. or he worked for the high school. Mm -hmm. So his retirement there will continue on through. Right. Yeah. The village. Okay. That's what that is. And is this? Uh, I guess a compliance issue. We just never adopted it. We don't have it at eighty eight. So and then Tammy, I think I have to say something correctly, is that 
It also says that you should start talking when you're 62 and 60. I'm at Pack 88. Tells us a little bit more on how to do that. That's right, you set up on investment. So mm -hmm. you have to be so long invested to make this work. I think it's still 10 years that we are now. Yeah, but so like when you work with more lots of you can better come over to this. Would that help you do that too or not? When you work for a lot of I don't have that anymore. Okay, I got gotcha. you. So anyway, it's, it's fun. Fun. Okay, so it's supposed to help the people that actually had MERS and they changed jobs or somebody quit here and they went to Wheel Center, mm -hmm. which we had to crack and do that. So. But so they, that way they don't have to keep picking it up every time. If they already belong to the nurse. That's my opinion. We just never had anything. We just had our own. We just be adopted into the. I guess what are uh, what are other folks doing? They let it where like Greg High School can pick his up and mm -hmm. continue using it. Those are what are the Her employees only affect Greg and Shane. Shane can bring his time from Stockbridge. Mm -hmm. um, most other communities allow this to our understanding. We met with MERS this last cost week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, MERS representative was here. Most communities adopt this program. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just bringing the village. The way I understood it the other day is just bringing the village up to current times. Yeah. And going forward with it, we could use it to attract talent, you know, because we're not going to be here forever. You know, Greg's on the verge of leaving, Shane's close. So in order to bring in more talent. So if you had a new guy with like four or five years in a place and you wanted to come here, you could transfer that on to this, this yeah. program. And mm -hmm. it wouldn't be holding back. And that. most, like I said, most communities statewide run their emergency program that way. So it's just a yeah. courtesy to their employee yeah. base. Like, you know, so I have to start over. Right. Yeah. The most important thing people are looking for is the benefits. And if they work somewhere and they're looking to move to a new job and they know that this is available to them, we may, when we're looking for someone, be able to get them to come here because that is available to them. Yeah. I mean, it could potentially affect us in, in the sense that if it if somebody were to retire before they were vested but now they become vested right? I mean, we're, we'd be paying into their pension and their MERS right am I misunderstanding that so like when Greg was hired in he had to wait 90 days mm -hmm. before he could start up so if you went right from the school, Right to the village of Waterville, his MERS would just continue on. And there wouldn't be no waiting period. It would just be not just two minutes. Okay. And it, and it would be the same thing if they had to move across Blue Shield, mm -hmm. and then the place that you go to work for, that would be continuous and go on. It wouldn't have to wait 90 days. So it's specific. And I asked to... Ryan that when we hired him. I said, hey, did you have the same insurance we do? Because it could just be. Is it just specific to healthcare? Nope, just the same. This is the same scenario as healthcare provides. So if the, if he had the same healthcare we did, automatically he could continue yeah. to witness a beat even though he changed jobs. Mm -hmm. This is like the retirement. So we'll just give you an idea. But this is for the retirement. This is for our workers' retirement. Right. Only. Only. This is what this covers. Um, like Brad has said multiple times, it's just because we don't have it adopted. Mm -hmm. But okay. that's the only thing that prevents. Greg and Shane from rolling their time over is because we don't have the doctor. Doesn't cost us anything. They roll yeah. instead of freezing that time, getting a hundred dollar bill and then a hundred dollar bill. Hell, they they can put them together and just get one check. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So I recommend the council that we adopt Act eighty eight. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> and for discussion as as, as percentage. <laughs> so what you got? Schulte? Yes. Sean Byrne? Yes. Danfield? Yes. Walter? Yes. Hitchcock? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so as we are doing our 2022 and 2023 budget, and our 2023 and our 2024, 
I've had multiple conversations, texts, back and forth with Kate. 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 Yes, She's worked very hard on this, and I apologize up front that we've been trying to bump back and forth, and we did change a couple things. Like we went to 150 to 175 thousand on the dump truck. Um, she's trying to split the roads up, which she had help doing that. So at this point, uh, we're, we're pretty close. We we could look at it some more and have a. This is a long meeting. We can look at it some more if if we choose. If we don't feel comfortable with what we've already read, and then we have to have an emergency meeting before the end of March. So we're accepted by April 1st with our new budget. So. And, and I do believe, like Josh Rocky mentioned, that when you when you look at 2022 and 2023 to adopt that, you want to adopt your new one also. So you want to be happy with both of them before you adopt just one of them. So, okay, because they do kind of collaborate. If there's any questions, let me know. I have a question. Yes. So, back in December, we had voted to get I believe it was the Polaris. Correct. And I remember that it was you had brought up the question about, well, what happens if we need a dump truck or something like that? That was one of your main questions. And I believe, Brad, you had said, well, there's enough in there to there, purchase both. We did, but we also shifted to the point where if we did do more work that our sidewalks will not work with a Polaris Ranger without adapting a feed plow blade. So we ruled out that you're still going to have to have a smaller combination for trying to remove snow for sidewalks. So are a, we still going to purchase something or do we need to go in and vote again to take that off? When we talked to the DPW guys and myself, we, we basically said that we'd rather focus that money on the dump truck and the, the vehicles that are important to the town versus adding the Polaris Ranger. Okay, but that was brought up in council, discussed in council, correct. voted in council, and correct. approved by council. Correct. But we, we, so at this point, what we have to do, because we have to go back in there and go, we, we have to then agree that, disagree that that was something we wanted to do. We haven't done that at this time. But yes, that money's still going to be spent in that, so that same area where that money was being spent on a Polaris Ranger would be spent on maintenance of other vehicles. Right. So, but well, I was just gonna say, so we voted that's right. to approve up to, I believe it was $35,000, and yeah. the amount we spent was zero. Yep. So, so Caitlin's working on that. With we, we could just spend said. one dollar if we wanted to, that would be allowed. <laughs> we, we, as we continue to keep working with that, we noticed that the SUV would be acceptable, but yet for what we were going to do with the sidewalks, every time we turned around, the blade that we thought we could adapt and use would be, it'd just be too big for the areas we were used to doing with the John Deere. So we ran into this on the physical area and being on site after we already approved it, thinking, wow, we got the council to approve this, but we feel that our money needs to be focused on Make sure our back truck's ready to go. Our dump trucks are having trouble. Um, our boom truck just today just up and quit. And then the other, what's the other one that we were wanting to work on? So we just kind of refocused where our energy was versus driving around a brand new Polaris Ranger. So we, we got to come back to you guys. And I did talk to Caitlin. Still have to talk to Scott Gould how we can go back and see what we have to do. What we have to do to bring it to the council saying, look, we, we've thought about this and we want to reverse the idea of doing the Flares Ranger and using the money to be spent on the commercial vehicles. Do we really need to do that though? I do, I do believe we have to go and. I mean, could we get another John Deere? Right, exactly. But would still, that solve the issue? Well, there's no issue to be done. We all agreed upon something, which is really neat. We did all that, and then when we got done, then we got ready to pursue it, and then other things happened. Other things went wrong. Well, and, we, and, and looking at this budget, I mean, could we afford it? 
Yes, but with this budget, we would have $52,000 left in the motor pool, which if we need to do an amendment because a piece of equipment breaks, you better hope it's less than 50 grand. Mm -hmm. Or getting that, you know, and Ryan, otherwise we're going to be going to the general fund, which right. doesn't look too hot. You've been in the field and you've seen me, so yeah. reinsure the council what we were trying to talk about as we thought about the new vehicle and then where we're at now. No, I understand what no, you're saying. Let, let Ryan, Ryan is here for with are you are you wanting to talk more about the Polaris Ranger and yeah, like why we, we, we always thought that, that was something that we were going to do and get yep. the depot laid up, and then all the other things happen. We all looked at each other like. This really it's, it's a good thing we didn't do it. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, our backhoe is sitting down right now. We had to drive it in reverse back to the shop because it broke down in a parking lot here in town. Uh, so we had to have the John Deere dealer come out. Yeah, yes. Field service, which is pretty expensive. He was here Friday night. I stayed late with him Friday night. I still don't know what time he left. Um, on that, we're waiting on a part from John Deere. No aftermarket parts for this equipment, so it's going to be expensive. Anything that says John Deere? Green for a reason. Yes, exactly. You got the bucket working, right? You know, what's that? You got the bucket working, so we use the bucket. Yeah, temporary. You know, we don't want to take it out in the field because he couldn't guarantee. He twisted wires together. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So we got that. Um, Who comes to the rescue? Yeah. Luckily, <laughs> we know somebody that has a backhoe that we could load salt with. Over the weekend, we needed salt. Uh, can't thank that company enough. <laughs> I was gonna bring my tractor in to do it, but we said, well, we can use this one. So anyways, fast forward to the weekend, we had snow events. The village has one truck that can salt the roads. That one truck is broken down right now. Uh, we got lucky over the weekend. Air temperature was warm. So we were able to get by. Uh, parts were delivered today for the truck. Hasn't been repaired yet. The mechanic was busy with some other stuff. Um, the bucket truck. We had a street sign come down at the school today. So we took the bucket truck out. It died on the road. I had to tow it back to the shop. Uh, BJ Hitch Hitchcock came out. He says, I can't fix it. It has to be towed. Wrecker showed up 20 minutes later, towed our truck. So we have a lot of money going out on this older equipment. Back to the sidewalks. What, you know, what are we going to do with our sidewalks? I think that is going to be a discussion that we're going to have to hold all summer long. What is our sidewalk policy? Who's responsible for what? I understand the way it's used to go, but was that against ordinance? Did we have you know, actual responsibilities to clear those sidewalks. So I think that's something that we should probably talk about before next winter because it's going to come again. So with that money, yes, it was great. That was my first council meeting here, meeting all you folks, watching you guys work together to approve that. I think, you know, it's still there if we need it, I guess. We've looked at other pieces of equipment. Uh, Shane and I, I know Brad's been involved. Sam, you've been down to the shop multiple times, you know, saying, hey, what about this? You know, we've, we've all kind of brainstormed on what piece of equipment might be best for our needs, but where are we at with the sidewalks? Who owns what? Who's responsible for it? Yeah, it's great for the DDA that we're out clearing these sidewalks. It looks good when people are driving through our, our community and seeing our sidewalks are clear in town. But do we have a village ordinance that says it's our responsibility? That part I don't know because it's, I'm... It's not. It's not the village's responsibility. We, we have the John Deere tractor with the plow on it. Um, so, in essence, we have just been doing it. As a courtesy. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we are responsible right for right downtown. Well, we're responsible for the parts that are owned by the village, i.e. out front of here. Yep. Um, there's a question about the bridge, you know, who's responsible for that uh, by the well pump down on the well, south side. I'm talking about like the four corners here. There's nothing in our ordinance that requires the village to keep, keep that clear. They just always done that. 
But the unique thing is, as we keep looking, what we were trying to do is have something warm, because we thought the max, and he said all it would do is basically try to get the steam off the window, you know, and he was dressed in snow. Know, so, yeah. so we were trying to think of something that you could actually be in and then have remove it. There is some different machines that would actually get work, but you, just, well, you still have to dress up like a snowmobile. Exactly. Thing. We can discuss it later. If they, I mean, there's other options too that are equipment. As I know, Josh had been talking to the landscaping company. I mean, yeah, we can like, contract it out. I would have somebody do our snow removal for us. But I, that, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll answer it. Sorry. Okay. But I think that's where you as a council need to visit the sidewalk mm -hmm. ordinance first. Well, but, yeah, that too. But I, I guess what concerns me is that whether it's for the Polaris or a dump truck or pick something else when it's brought to the council and you all gave me books to read so I've been reading the books and it's debated brought up voted on and approved that should be law that should not be your job or her job or my job two weeks later to come back and say, what, yeah, we're not, we're, we're not gonna do that. That should be brought up again to council and re-issued, re-voted on. Because um, otherwise, what are we all sitting here for? We will. Oh, okay. We okay. will. Um, no, 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 that's, Deborah, that's, that's great. No, we will, and I knew that that was something that would have to be brought up to the council again saying, look, we prolonged it. And the other thing is, even if you ordered a John Deere, it still wouldn't even be here. Oh, God, no. It's no. So, great point. But what we want to do, once we figure out what's happening, like, we think, gosh, that's, we got to bring it to the council. Everybody's going to have to understand, like, we would prefer a scoop shovel on the corner and mm -hmm. helping with the salt and snow removal at that time and getting the truck straightened around because we got, we got some breakdowns we didn't know that were coming. Uh, and God only knows the John Deere backhoe that was supposed to be mm -hmm. the state of the art that's new enough. The, the electronic over hydraulics is what's causing the problem on that. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, a, well, they're it's like an ECM. No, it's not. It's actually new. But it's an ECM. It's like a brain telling the hydraulics to work. For the backhoe that I have is hydraulic levers. Everything's done. When you move it, it's hydraulic moved. It doesn't have electric over hydraulic. And that's what's wrong with the backhoe. So, so, I mean, not, not to interrupt, but I mean, I'm glad Scott's back because I'll defer to him on this. But, Scott, on, on this issue of uh, approving funds for this John Deere data that, that we never purchased, and, and I don't think we intend to at this point, the original approval was an expenditure up to a certain amount. And the question on the table is, do we need to go back and have an additional vote to tidy up that loose end to say, no, we're not going to purchase this anymore when, you know, if it's up to a certain amount, the amount could be zero, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's, what's proper procedure here? The, the council's set on not pursuing it, then that, that matter is foregone. We all approve so thirty five thousand and yeah, brand new right. players. So we, it has to be brought back up again and re voted. I would, I, that's what I would, I would close it out. If if, if, you, if I understand you right, you're saying, hey, it's not our intention to purchase a, this vehicle anymore. Mm -hmm. I would motion to close that out. And if you if and in the future a new one came up, bring that back around. Okay, we can revisit it at a later date. Yeah, I mean that's how I see it, just to make sure that there's no loose ends, because things may change in the next go around as to why you want a vehicle, the particular vehicle you want, so. Now, I'll remind you, you weren't here, but when, when that initially, I don't, when that initially became something that we wanted to do, and then we went around and checked it, we couldn't get one immediately unless we right. got a used one. Right. And then we denied getting a used one, then we went, all right, we're going to buy a new one. And then it was, yeah, you can have it for fall of 2023. 
So in the meantime, why we're like scratching our head, like, yeah, we got to order one, wait nine, ten yeah. months for it. Correct. We have some major breaks. Right. 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 And so we're right. like, you know, I'd rather have this fixed than that. So we'll move with the next council meeting. If everybody agrees about what we're dealing with as far as maintenance, we'll bring it, make sure it's on the list correctly to bring it back to council saying that per the DPW and our maintenance of our old aged equipment, we would like to reverse the Polaris Ranger at this time okay. and focus on the other maintenance. Okay. Okay. But, but with the budget, the way it is, there, it is, is neither, either way it couldn't have been spent this year, which Kate was working on. She's like, are you gonna spend 35,000 before the end of the year? Because I'd like to do numbers. I gotta put notes in there, which is in our 2022, 2023. Right. And I said at this time we couldn't even. The only way you would get one that quick is you'd have to buy one used, right. or buy one new off the lot and then revise it and mm -hmm. change it that way. But they they wouldn't give us the exact John Deere, which Mr. Uh, Sam, you, you tried to get one all spec'd out with John Deere, and we would be able to get it all rigged up for the fall of 2023. But we never could have got it during our storm this year. Right. It would have been dicey in terms of timing. Right, it had been like tail end of where it ran. And, and then we started having water main breaks by the sidewalks and we kept looking. And, oh. and then we were driving my Polaris and we got um, Shane's Polaris. Yep. We started driving them on the sidewalks just for the, because we were there with a water main break, like we're not even on the sidewalk. This, this really is a hangover. Well, to bring this back to the budget discussion at hand is, I mean, in terms of that $35,000 being spent this year, I don't see it happening, but. The one thing that I did have a question about is, you know, a lot of the different, you know, the major streets, minor streets, I'm seeing a, a pretty high equipment rental. And I mean, I would ask for your input and Shane's input on what do you rent the most often? And should we look at considering purchasing one? Cause I, I mean, from what I understand is you guys could probably make use out of a, out of a mini digger, right? I mean, what so oh do you mean as far as using uh, Stevens? Right. Well the equipment rentals that how you guys That's how when that's, you see that's that that's showing around from the our, DPW. That's how no, that's the internal charge. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Charge we did a lot of mistakes to the equipment fund. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm like, we, I yeah, right. Right. That's how we show it so that you know that it's part of it. Which the the jump truck the dump trucks were decades ago. Right. The only gotcha. thing that's going for us is because the emissions aren't there and they got the right transmission and the right engines and they're, you know, the original rear ends, but some of the other things have been going bad. That's yeah. minor. With the, newest, the newest trucks are 2006. It's, right. We got lucky with that. Like what he said, it's the right transmission. So we're pretty much certain that the parts that came are going to fix it. Uh, BJ scanned it. You know, it's not some bad transmission let's just say that mm -hmm. so the repair should be, able to be yeah. done tomorrow yeah done. that's our that's our goal is tomorrow right but we stood know. out there at night thinking that we were going to have to take the shovels of the backhoe and scatter in the intersections to make sure yeah. we had salt in the intersections so that's why we stood there and scratched I would, we could do this with a brand new Polaris Ranger or we could probably focus on Trying to make sure. I was going to put Max in the dump truck. And Max in the dump truck. Yeah, just put salt as I drive around. Poor Max, right? So, so that was where we came to the come to Jesus and said, "Look, we we need to relook at this again because this is something that's mm -hmm. creeped up on us that we didn't see coming." Okay. But so yeah, so back to our budget amendment. I I'm comfortable with it, but if if the council wants to look at it some more. And we we can do an emergency meeting. Yes, sir. Just a simple question on that. Um, you're talking about that John Deere Gator. Yes, sir. Um, what Deborah said that everything went through council, and that purchase was approved. That money was approved for that particular purchase. Yep. A group of people got together and decided, no, we're not going to do that. Has any of those funds been spent on anything else? Nope. Not yet. Nope. Okay. That thirty that says we can spend up to thirty five thousand on a brand new SUV. It could be a Polaris or it could be uh, a Bobcat. Right, right. But, but what I'm getting at is none of those funds have been been exhausted. Spent on truck repairs yet 
for backhoe repairs or any of that? Yeah. Nope, that's okay. It's different identity. It's not been exhausted yet. Okay. It's still there to use. Well, or we could come to the council and say, look, we, we re looked at this on some of the other equipment that we got that surprisingly had an error, you know, that's causing us maintenance. We could reverse this and wait and then pursue right. it to our other equipment. That's exactly why our accountant is wanting to know if we're going to spend that $35,000 in the next realistically 30 days or something. Because if we don't, then she needs to account for that in next year's budget planning. So, no, it hasn't been spent. But yes, that, that's still sitting there. We still can go for it and uh, have the Polaris Ranger or whatever it would be for the sidewalk right. removal. But then we also looked at it when we had the water main breaks that we're thinking the vehicle is probably going to be too big. Maybe we should look at some of these. That the, right. It looks like a little uh, bulldozer and the guy's riding on the back of it. Right. It's got four tires because we've only just got to do up town. We, we're trying to get a vehicle so the John here don't sit down here in the garage nine months out of the year and only gets used three months out of the year. And the transmission got tore out of it and it was $1,800 from Iowa to get the transmission rebuilt on a John Deere that was 23 years old. Right. So we, we could have did that, but we kept focusing on how to multitask that vehicle to use it more than just, and it didn't work that well anyway. And, and Max was just, <laughs> Max was honest, like, man, you wouldn't believe how hard it is well, to make it work. I think that John Deere was purchased 20 years ago to mow lawns out at the lagoons, and I think then an appropriate mower was purchased, and we said, oh, what are we going to do with this tractor? Ah, stick a plow on him. Clear the snow. all-wheel drive. And everybody you talk to to do the all-wheel drive, that's where they vote no. They say, we can get you a transmission and, and be very reasonable and put change on your tires, but we, we can't get you the all-wheel right. drive. I mean, that transmission, we took it out. It had three drive shafts to it. And it was one off the engine that went into it, and then the other one's the rear axle, and the one with the front axle. And you can't find that anywhere on the internet. I've searched for hours and I can't find that. Eighteen hundred dollars in Iowa. And that's not common shipping. That's right. just that's where it's well, at. Repair was gonna be eight grand. Right? Yeah. For a twenty two, twenty three year old tractor. So we started looking, but everything bounces to twenty to and then when we talk about getting a new dump truck, you know, like, oh this is gonna be great. The guy goes, Oh yeah, we can do that three hundred days. I said, Thirty days? He goes, Three hundred. Ten months. I'm like, wow. And then, then I got to talking to him more, and he goes, I do have possible three windows, April, May, June, that I'm waiting on that possibly wasn't taken. But January, February, March was out. So if they, they got built in them, them windows, we would have a truck available by this fall. So, and that was Frankliner. No Have they thought about leasing? Municipality, you get that discount from, I want to say Mita, did I say right. that right? Deals. My deal. My deals. So my deal, and, and when you customize that, you, you don't get the lease. I, I, you can lease the pickups if you want to lease the pickups. Well, I mean, the state leases everything except for uh, um, job specific DNR trucks. Okay. Um, and their high rails that they use on the train tracks, they don't lease those, they buy those because. They have to be modified with the high And the modification comes with this dump truck and also comes with the state garage. I know Jim out there, and they're $310,000 that they modify them, so they have to purchase them. But, yeah. Well, yeah, you're talking about that? Yep. Okay, I retired out of management and budget, medium and heavy truck mechanic. Everything for the last 15 years, except for MDOT, because right. they're their own thing. <laughs> yeah. um, Everything that the state has is leased, whether it's BMW motorcycle for state police, whether it's their cruisers, whether it's um, dive trucks, it doesn't matter. It's all leased. Okay. And the state did that just to save money. I didn't know. Because they don't put everything out front to buy it. It, it all, you know, it all, right. it's all payment. And they keep them for as long as they want. When they're done, they get once they're paid off, they sell them, and they keep whatever they get from them. Cool. Well, good idea. Check that out. Thank you.
Uh, I did have one question about the budget, and I don't know, if Josh, if you looked into this anymore, but I saw that the, uh, I think it's the TIF, or the, the DDA distribution is budgeted for $170,000 still in Caitlin's most recent budget, and I thought that, I thought that the new DDA distribution, uh, once they had gone through and, uh, I don't know what the right term is, but, but looked at the, at the property, um, the parcel ID assignments for the TIF district, that that number went up way more than 170, right? Well, I'll say it was 180 something, but I know just the just number. I don't know what the, um, maybe I'll actually get the budget for you. We have it on our budget. Yeah, right now it's budgeted for 170. Last year it was 160. Yeah, it's the 160 number. I don't think it's correct either. I thought at one point when you and I talked, it was closer to like 200,000. It was, and then there was some stuff that had to be readjusted. Okay. Because the numbers went through. So we just got the 2020 payment which was there was 178,000 and then there was another 22,000 or 2200 sorry so 79 yeah that was i mean 2020 it was 178 so we should see our next payment should be coming up here too because you guys should have been obviously you're a year behind on that right. payment so I don't know if that's something we need to bring to Caitlin's attention that maybe we're a little underfunded or, or this is smaller than what, what the distribution is actually going to be for 24. Yeah, I mean, if that's a proposed budget, obviously the proposed budget can be amended, right, um, based on what the actual numbers are. I just, I didn't realize there was further adjustments since you and I talked that it doesn't seem like it's as far off then. Which is good. Yeah. To correct that, I was actually wrong. I was looking at the wrong year. Um, it's kind of hard to look on following the big spreadsheet. Um, it was 183.5907 mm -hmm. this last year, and it is up to date. So, you guys actually did pay your tip of payment to date. Yeah, that makes so, sense. I've never seen that recently. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to correct it because I just actually saw it. I didn't realize that my little phone doesn't show all the different sheets on here. You said it was 180, 180 what? 183.5907. And obviously that's going to go up every year because of property values right. increasing. And we'll, we'll probably have to do a budget amendment then. Yeah. Okay. Which I'd have to talk to Caitlin how that works because that's actually just a pass through. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if technically you guys budgeting for it is actually a real necessity because you guys literally the money comes in and then it gets distributed to the DDA. Like there's no well, it's still an expenditure. Yeah. Though. I mean if you're planning on a certain amount going out and yeah. if that amount that goes out is higher. Right. But it's the same thing as income. Obviously you have the income coming in that you guys capture and then it gets sent to us. I thought it wasn't being captured mm -hmm. It wasn't beginning they there's adjustments that had to be done so it was being captured correctly just not accounted for correctly correct yeah gotcha okay. yeah because the taxes are always the same the gotcha. property taxes are it's just how much you guys give are supposed to give us um is where it comes into play gotcha okay 
so that kind of goes hand in hand with your guys' income because obviously you guys will get any access will come in and it will get accounted for based on what the property values are right which i don't know how you guys would be able to account for anyway because i don't that's why caitlin makes big bucks <laughs> she's got a bigger brain i've seen the checks we pay them <laughs> We're still going over the budget. Just looking for a recommendation. What do you want to recommend it as as presented? To because it's a draft. These drafts look pretty close. Mm -hmm. I didn't get all my. She was supposed to give me more notes, and she did not give me more notes. I think it's because she kept correcting them as I went. Well, I mean we. I guess realistically, we have to approve it tonight, and if there's further questions, we can have that emergency meeting, right? Otherwise, we have to have an emergency meeting to approve it. You guys are meeting in this month, though, don't you? 28th. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Your, yeah, your budget is due uh, by the April first, first. Right. Yeah. So you guys should be fine. You scared me for a second, so I'm like, well, we haven't met the hasn't meant to approve our budget yet to present right. to you guys so, <laughs> so <laughs> I forgot we're speaking it up. Like you guys might have to have an emergency meeting because <laughs> our budget hasn't been approved. <laughs> I guess I'm so used to the last few years we get down to the, the wire. You know and the other thing was we always had one one a month that we approved everything and the other one was a work session. So yes. every, right. so every time we turned around we couldn't approve two times in one month. That's why it was called emergency. Yeah, and there's many times where <clears throat> after we finalize everything and then we, we got to the, the actual final budget that we were supposed to vote on, mm -hmm. it was messed up. And then we had to approve on amendment. So, I mean, I have no further questions. I'm okay making a motion unless, Brad, you want to wait until next meeting. I have no problem either way. I think we can. I'm waiting right here. So the, all the questions she had earlier. Because if you're still waiting for feedback from Caitlin, then there's probably <coughs> worth waiting until next meeting since we can. Because for the portion between Grand River and Cherry Street, the approximate cost of the road is 249.084, and the approximate cost of the water is 146.619. So she got that information put in there. Yeah, that was for the portion between Grand River and Cherry. Yes. Yeah, because of uh, that's the portion that the DEA can actually contribute to mm -hmm. because it's inside our district. Yeah. And uh, whatever we come up with with the council, the thirty-five thousand that we set aside for a vehicle that we use for sidewalk using and SUV using. It's set aside, we can readjust that. It, it shouldn't make any difference to this part of it. It's just money pulled in that same spot. So, right. um, we so it would have to be added back in. No, because we haven't spent it. We, we, but it's been approved. And allocated, yeah. Right. I mean, we can make a motion to readjust that right now, can't we? Mm. Not sure. Can we, Scott? I mean, what they'd have to do is they'd have to go to, they would have to talk or reflect the minutes of the, the meeting that they approved it they approved and, it. and word for word the motion and then um, rescind it yeah, probably. or disapprove it or I don't know, you know the legal term on that, but probably we've had a chance to pull that, their pull of minutes. Yeah. Unless you were in she sent them to already. She did. I was trying to find them because. Um, what meeting was that? December, the first one in December. The special one. Yeah, I was going to say, we I didn't know that was published already. already. It was, it's on there. Yeah. Yeah, no, the first one in December, it was brought up mm -hmm. and discussed. Mm -hmm. Then the second one. It was the second the emergency meeting. One? Yeah, okay. in December. Yeah, because it's a, a special one because yeah. that's when you got hired, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So that's the special one. Yeah. So December 20th was the special meeting. We need to add a, a seventh 
right into our agenda to do that? You know, and the whole thing is, as I keep thinking about this, we're going to have to do something. It just might not be the SUV side. It would be a, a vehicle that would be something that would remove the snow. There's, like I said, that one looks like a little bulldozer that would run like a yeah. dozer. That you see quite a few of them in Okemos mm -hmm. that you use for the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it seems like what most municipalities and use is up to the closed cows to run the road and ruin the brooms. Break down. They're not designed for that. Oh, um, really? Yeah. That one I'd seen the guy in Okemos going down, and he had like the little scatter in the back of him. And mm -hmm. I thought that, other than he had to have snow to sit on, but it, was, but, it, but, it, but it was doing the job. You know, it's man warmers and. Well, if you get the right piece of equipment, it's less time you have to spend outside. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, something new. I, I Googled it. I've seen it one time. Well, uh, have you seen them where the, the guy's behind it and it's yeah. got the port? I think Aaron's makes that. It's called a mammoth or something. It's kind of a wild little maintenance thing. You know, yeah. It's got a little spreader to it and everything. It's pretty cool. Once it starts looking into it, there's a lot of a lot of sidewalk snow removal equipment out there that so, we didn't know existed. <laughs> So the 35,000 can still be there open for this. this well, and not, to, to be there. not to reopen the wound, but I mean, there's nothing in our ordinance requiring us to do snow removal. And I don't think right. it's in the taxpayer's benefit to spend $35,000 or more on a piece of equipment that's only used for three months out of the year just for snow removal. And that was one of the arguments that we were always raising to ourselves. It's like, a very expensive to courtesy to use. And but until if a, somebody falls and right. breaks a hip, and now we have litigation because it's village property. The sidewalk is village property. I hope it's the storefront owner responsibility to clear it. I, I think we should hold out our ideas, keep keep your little financial our budget for them. Everybody can look at it some more if you have a couple more questions, because we got it here in front of us. She sped through it, you know, no one, I mean, she's great at what she does, Caitlin. You guys can bring this back on our next meeting, and then at that time we'll have Jessica pull up the minutes when we get the Polaris Ranger. Okay. Bring it back up to you guys' thoughts. We'll explain to you our maintenance that we've been dealing with and what we, our thoughts might change for some of the newer vehicle versus. Uh, okay, I, I, I understand all that. But basically what I'm trying to say to you is you want us to approve the budget that we've allocated my, or approved money that's supposed to be in this budget that we need to take out for that budget and we can reinsert it on next year's budget do, do you see what i'm saying no oh, okay i wish i did but okay we have so i said we, we hold on and not approve the budget Okay. And work with Caitlin on knowing that the thirty-five thousand is not going to be used for Claire's Ranger before. Okay. The 2023, 2022, 2023, so that we are open on that understanding mm -hmm. with Caitlin. Like, what did you do with that? Right. Okay, because it's there, mm -hmm. and we didn't use it yet. Mm -hmm. But but I'm pretty sure that that says we used thirty-five thousand in the very start of twenty twenty-three. You got all the way until. Christmas or you know this year to use it, order it, and get it still could happen. But if we want to talk about not doing that, we won't. So, so we'll bring, okay, okay. As long as Caitlin okay. is aware, we're not going to spend the money before April first of this year. She can account for it in the budget, and then we have twelve months to decide: do we buy that piece of equipment, or take a vote to say we're not going to buy that piece of equipment, or vote on buying a different piece of equipment? Okay, I'm okay with that. Are you guys um, approving your? It was, are you guys looking to approve your amended budget or your proposed budget? Because there'd be two of them. There, yep. One, there's like a budget amendment yeah. and yeah, proposed yeah. budget. Yeah, amendment is pretty much as close to your final before the end of the year hits, which would be something you want to go as close to the end of the fiscal year as possible, and then the proposed is obviously a. I, yeah. I, I see no benefit to voting tonight if we can do it this close to the yeah. And I mean, it'd be clean possible. too, because then, like I said, the DDA will be out of proposing our budget mm -hmm. at that meeting too, so then you guys can kind of vote them both in. And... 
That's what I told both of them. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we all agree that we're going to look at our, and then we'll communicate, and the 28th, at that time, we should have enough knowledge, and we can approve our budget. Right? Right. Okay. okay. Ryan Jones, thank you for being part of our Village of Waterville. Is there anything on the council's end of it that you see that you'd like from us? I appreciate the work you've done so far. Oh, so happy and look forward to continuing to serve in this community. Appreciate that. Okay, with that said, we added on the Northern Pump and Well. I recommend the council to. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are we going to talk about what happens if he gets any what, more licenses or anything like that? Um, about that, I am scheduled May 4th to take my sewer lagoon test through the state of Michigan. Okay. Um, and then in the fall, I'm going to do my limited treatment water. Uh, Eagle wasn't as concerned about that because I already have a water license for the distribution side of things. So it was kind of recommended that I get my sewer license first. Okay. Um, so that's going to be May 4th. Okay. Um, I know we had discussed once I get that license, um, I'll be my hourly rate. My hourly rate. So I'll keep everybody posted, you know, on okay. my test results. Okay, cool. Thank you. That is cool. I just thought I would bring it up. Yep. Why? Yeah. 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 yeah, we just said, when you get licenses, we can follow it up. I'm sure you knew, but I just thought oh. I would ask. <laughs> you don't know unless you ask. No. And I think you knew that up front, too, right? When you yeah. get the licenses. Well, when when you and I spoke about yep. coming down here, you know, get the licenses. A number was brought to the table, and I, I declined the number that was given to me. And I said, well, I'd rather go this route. I'm more comfortable, you know, to prove myself. I've done my 90 days. I think I've kind of proven what I can do, what I bring to the community. Um, Shane's not here to speak on my behalf. I know Jess is listening. She was hoping I would give a speech in a third person. <laughs> I didn't give myself a review, but <laughs> I don't think we need to go that route. But I spent time with you and Shane down there at the yep. DPW garage. Yep. We talked um, I know Tammy has seen production out of me. Um, I'm down to four addresses, I think, on uh, water meter changes. Mm -hmm. I was with Grant. I was on Grant Everly. Really, yeah. Yep. Brad witnessed uh, how I handle some of them. I just kind of walk in and say, "Here I am." <laughs> he was really surprised to see me. <laughs> I, uh, we're doing the high school uh, at the end of the month um, on spring break. That way, we don't affect the students at all uh, because water does have to be shut down. Uh, the last meeting, Shane came in all wet. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's we had the big meter at Aldi. Um, that was fun just because the meter was about seven feet in the air. So, but I'm down to four addresses, I do believe, mm -hmm. uh, and they're vacant properties. Except for one, the guy's still in Florida. He just hasn't came home yet. But the others are vacant. I'm not going to put a new water meter into a vacant building until they establish water service. So, I think I've I think I've done what I told you I was going to do, Brad. Well, you have the other one that you got to do the pit thing or something. Oh, yes, yeah. We have one that we have to install a meter pit for. Mm -hmm. um, I got Shane Smith that's on a pit. We haven't been able to read this meter in, what, six, seven years. They built a crawl space over the water meter. Um, I attempted to gain access. I had to lay on my side, put my hands up over my head. Now we're getting into a pretty dangerous confined space situation, and I never did see the meter. So I couldn't get close enough to the meter in that crawl space. That's wow. where we had to go in the house, to cut, cut a hole in the living room floor. Yeah. Oh, wow. So our plan of action now is we're, we're going to put a meter pit outside with the meter in there. The old water meter is going to stay in that crawl space, become the responsibility of that property owner, because we didn't do that. Yeah. Um, our water ordinance, I do believe, states we have to have access to the water meter. We have no access. So if that water meter inside ever leaks, if there's ever an issue, they're going to have to fix it because our water meter is going to be outside of that. Which we have to put down below the front slot. Yeah, the pit be 48 inches deep. Um, inside of it, there are they're called risers that brings the water meter up to a manageable level where we cannot access the water meter, maintain it if need be, put a lid on it, and they don't freeze because the, the ground down at 48 inches deep is warmer, so the heat comes up prevents that water meter from freezing. Most communities use meter pits. Um, I came from the city of Owasso. Up there we had 
1,500 to 2,000 water meter bits. Um, very rarely did we have a problem. So that's going to be one that, that we have to address. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a cost incurred on our side of it, but we'll recoup that cost in reading the water meter accurately and billing them correctly for it. So uh, 90 days, I can't believe it's been that long already. <laughs> you know, um, I'm glad they can't plan. But I think Shane would, would speak pretty positive. Um, a lot of improvements down in the garage, equipment maintenance, things that I'm able to do instead of having to pay somebody to do. Um, I'm able to do it. Uh, Shane's off this week. He's up north at a conference, so I'm filling in for him. So I'm happy. I don't want to go anywhere. Um, I enjoy this council so far, and you know, when it comes a new year, so yay. Thank you. Yep. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. So the one that we put on our agenda to begin with, very fun. Or I told everybody we want to add on to our new business. It would be the Northern Pump and Well out of Lansing. We have to vote on Ryan? We have to vote on Ryan? No, yeah. we don't have to vote on Ryan. just recognizing his provisions over. Okay. Right. Underneath that, it has uh, is it a motion to approve or disapprove yeah. Ryan's probation period. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's a good one. I recommend to the council that we continue using Ryan Jones. For using him. Using him. <laughs> using him. <laughs> using him. Using <laughs> So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Schulte? Yes. Sean Born? Yes. Danfield? Yes. Walter? Yes. Hitchcock? Yes. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now you're official. <laughs> now I'm stuck. I have to be used. I know. I, I got you. I just want to make sure Northern Pump and Well gets their money. So, Northern Pump and Well, uh, not to exceed $2,185 to proceed uh, the additional controls for wells one, two, and three. This was something that would come up in the last minute, right, Ryan? Uh, it was discovered when we did the upgrades to Well House 1 and 2. You need a single splitter, flow meter, some of the other things that they said once they got our, so we weren't hammering our water, they said continue and have these put in also. Yeah. They probably already pre ordered them, didn't they? Uh, usually, I do believe stuff like that, they kind of have it stock. stock. Yeah, it's a very common issue. Uh, basically, you just don't want to over chlorinate your water or under chlorinate it. So, it will communicate to our chemical pumps because we will the chemical pumps slowly start up now and slowly no, yep. shut down. So we want our chlorine to be able to concentrate the same way. If council members are ever curious about the wells, you know they see these two buildings in town, but you've never seen inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I don't think Shane would ever mind either. If you guys ever yeah. want to see the wells? Just how you know. Um, take in. We can explain what's going on what we have to do to them to take you out to the water tower if you want to see that. I mean, that's pretty cool. It's, it's things that you guys have never seen before, but you see it in your community every day. So if you ever want a tour of it, just holler. I would, you know, you guys approved me, so now I got to, yeah. <laughs> Let's just set up a field trip. There we go. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. fancy paint job you did. There. Yes, that's not done. <laughs> Where's that bus that you took from the fire department? We're going to need that. <laughs> sure. Just just holler. I mean, my number, I don't think it's on the website yet. Um, but, you know, just you can, holler. Like, email. In the office now. Yeah, or just tell the girls, you know, that, hey, we want to see it. Okay. You know, and we'll get you in there so you guys understand what it is we're talking about when we come up here asking for money. Mm -hmm. So. And we need to be easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the motion for the 2185 of Northern Pump Well and the uh, date 313-2023 is proposal number 23-Q2798, not the theme, 2185. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Schulte? Yes. Thornborn? Yes. Stanfield? Yes. Walter? Yes. Hitchcock? Yes. Thank you. Any 
other things that the council wants to bring to the council's attention? Anything else? Everybody good? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Vote same time. Here. Vote at 857. Yeah.